Number 5. Last night, a friend rushed me out of the house to catch the opening act at a local bar's music night. After a few drinks, I realized my phone wasn't in my pocket. I checked the table we were sitting at, at the bar, the bathrooms, and after no luck, I used my friend's phone to call mine. After two rings, someone answered, gave out a low, raspy giggle, and hung up. They didn't answer again. I eventually gave it up as a lost cause and headed home. I found my phone laying on my nightstand, right where I left it. Number 4. When I was a kid, I was always the last kid to get picked up by the bus driver to go to school. One day I was waiting for the bus by myself and a bus with no kids pulled up. The bus driver smiled and told me to hop on. I just had a bad feeling. I said, where are the other kids? He said, we will go get them now. Just get on. He got more and more pushy but didn't do anything crazy. I just kept saying no and he shrugged and left. The real bus pulled up a few minutes later. I went to school and my parents didn't know until I mentioned it that night. Looking back, they were pretty worried. I remember them scrambling to make a few phone calls. Number 3 A few years back, I rented an apartment from a friend of mine. He had recently bought it and had it completely renovated. He put it up for sale but couldn't find a buyer so I offered to rent it in the meantime. After moving in, I realized there was something wrong with the lady next door. She was about 45 but looked much older. She would sit up all night listening to Christian radio shows and talking loudly to someone. It got to the point where I couldn't sleep so I went over to her place and asked her to keep it down. She opened the door and I got a quick peek. Her walls all had crosses painted on them in different colors and words like Jesus and angels scribbled everywhere. The windows were painted black, letting no light in at all. It was damp, yellow stained 50 year old carpets, dog shit and cockroaches everywhere. No dog though. I asked her to please keep it down. She just looked at me and shut the door. Then she turned up the radio even louder. The next night I had my girlfriend staying over. I wake up in the middle of the night and see a shadow of a person next to the bed looking at us sleeping. I think I'm hallucinating as I usually do in the dark when I'm sleepy. But then the shadow starts talking. It's my neighbor and she's holding something in her hand. She broke in during the night and who knows how long she stood there. You should lock your doors at night, she says and walks out. The next morning I hear someone making strange noises below my bedroom window. It's my neighbor talking to herself in tongue. She has a plastic bag in her hand with her rotting dead dog inside. It's hot as hell outside and I can smell death from that bag. At this point I'm scared shitless. She's obviously very insane. I go upstairs and knock on another person's door and ask them what the hell is going on. The guy is as scared as me. Apparently she broke into his apartment one evening as well while he was watching TV with his kids. He got up from the couch to get a snack, only to find her behind the couch, staring at him holding a power drill. Come to think about it, now I know what was in her hand. At this stage, I'm basically shitting myself. I call the cops and they know all about her. Apparently she's a violent schizophrenic and she hasn't taken her meds, but they can't force her or enter her apartment without her permission because she owns it. The only thing they can do is get her when she goes outside. I sit up for the next two days, waiting for her to run out of cigarettes. When I hear her leave at 2am to go across the road to the 7-Eleven, I call the cops. They have three cars and a special van over in less than two minutes. They restrain her and throw her in the van and drive off to some institution, and in less than a minute, it's like she was never there. I never see her again. Still have nightmares about her looking at me in my sleep. Number 2 I was about 15 minutes from finishing the night shift at work when there was a massive crash on one of the windows in the office, so I get up and go check it out. Someone has thrown quite a sizable rock through one of the windows on the front of the building. This is made especially weird because I'm working in the industrial district at 11.30 at night with none of the other businesses open. I go back to my desk, put a quick call through to security to let them know and decide to head home. 
As I'm leaving the building, I'm freaking myself out about it more and more and end up running to my car, getting in and taking off. I'm almost home and I've started to calm down a bit when I realize that I didn't unlock my car when I got in. It had been unlocked the whole time. I do a quick check with my hand in the back seat for any possible murderers that might be hanging around there, but there's nothing there. Fast forward about 30 minutes. I've called a friend of mine who says he's out drinking, so I decide I'm going to join him. I jump on my bicycle and start riding over. I'm doodling along the road on my bike. It's a nice night and I'm in no big rush, just enjoying the moonlight when I hear someone riding behind me. I straighten up and stick to one side of the road. He passes me really slowly and when he's right beside me, he shoots me a smile and I can describe it as purely insane. I kind of flinch and am taken aback as he rides on. That's when I realize he's riding my mom's bike. Needless to say, I sprint the hell home. When I get there, sure enough, her bike is missing and one of my car's doors is open. The back left one. I was driving and had no need to open that door. Number 1. I worked at a campground on night shift, 12am to 8am every night. It wasn't bad. I would bring in my PS2 and game a good portion of the night, only having to deal with one or two people on busy nights. It was just me in this little 8 foot by 8 foot shack, with nothing around but dark all night. My first week there, the other third shift guy who was quitting told me about this payphone a few feet from the shack where I worked. He said it rang every night at 4.17am, just once. It was probably just an automated test call, he guessed. He's never answered it himself. I go for a few months with the job. It was the middle of the summer, so most nights I had the windows closed, so I couldn't hear the payphone go off. Mid-August, I started leaving the windows open during the night. Sure enough, at 4.17am every morning, the phone would ring once. The ring even sounded creepy, like the payphone was submerged in water and then put where it sat. One night I got up the nerve to answer it. I set an alarm at 4.15 and would go wait at the phone until it rang. When it did, I answered it, but there was no sound, just dead air like someone was on the other line but wasn't answering. I said hello a few times and hung up. I did this every night for a week with the same results. I didn't think anything of it and left it alone after that for about a month. The first week of October, I decided to answer the phone once again. I set my alarm and when the time came, I answered the phone. I repeatedly said hello into the phone. Then I heard what sounded like someone inhaling through clenched teeth. The voice that sounded was rough and sounded like he had gargled gravel. He said my name my complete name, first, middle, and last. It was a voice I've never heard. My voice caught in my throat and I hung up. I rattled some change into the payphone and hit star 69. The number had come from California. I lived in Indiana. I moved to my dad's when I was 10 and I didn't know anyone in the area except for the family my dad was friends with, a single mom with three kids. Luckily there was a girl a couple of years older than me. She was 12 at the time I met her and we got to know each other a little over a couple of years. We weren't close but we ended up having the same friends. One night my friend Rob was hanging out with her and her younger brother. They happened to be in the house alone because my friend's mom was at work. Her mother has been helping this one lady through her work and got to know her fairly well. She found out her sister was in a mental institution and was let out recently. The night Rob is hanging out with my friend, they get a knock on the door. My friend thought it was just their mom, since she knocks a certain way when coming in, and he answered it without thinking. Rob wasn't supposed to be there and he took off through the window to his house down the road. He never thought twice about it. It wasn't her mom. It was the sister of the lady her mom was helping, and she figured out through talking to her sister where her family lived, 
and her mom's working schedule. She came in. This is where I don't know the details, and I'm glad I don't. My friend's younger brother got away to the neighbor's house to call the police. The lady brutally murdered my friend a week from Christmas, decapitated her, and left her body naked in a bathtub. She even hid her head. They had to look through the presents, and I don't know where they found it, but they did. I wasn't allowed to go to her funeral. It happened to my wife's grandmother about 15 years ago while we were still dating. Her husband had just passed away about a year previously, but she'd been going down to the library and volunteering. It was exercise and socialization. This was in the winter, so her walk back was while it was getting dark. The library closed at 5 and there was some extra stuff to do before everyone actually left. And on this particular night, she turned down a ride from another volunteer because she needed to stay in shape. The house is about a mile away through some lightly wooded area in South Texas, and as she's about halfway home, she notices someone behind her. He's walking the same direction and gaining on her, which in itself isn't all that particular. She's old and thus not particularly fast, but in this case he seems vaguely sinister. They keep walking, pretty soon he's right behind her, then he falls into pace just staying behind her. Now she knows something's up. But she's almost home. She can see the top of her driveway coming up, and she leaves her lights on so it'll look like someone's home when she's walking in. She just needs to make it another 150 yards. Then 100. All that time, she said he was so close that she could feel his breath on her neck. Around maybe 50 yards, it happens. A strong hand on her shoulder. Okay, bitch. Don't turn around and hand over your purse, or I'll cut you. She stops for a second, then takes one big step forward, turns, and shoots the guy in the neck with the 38 she keeps in her purse. The guy spent the next five years in a prison hospital before he died of complications. My wife's grandmother passed last year, but up to the end, she lamented that she pulled the trigger too soon. When I was young, I'd say 8 to 11-ish, my sister, whom is seven years older, would babysit when my parents were out. At the time, she smoked a lot, and my parents made her smoke outside, of course. So I'd follow her outside, play around, annoy her and such. One day, my sister notices a car at the end of the driveway, just sitting in the road. It's a white SUV with a bike rack on top. It has the most tinted windows I've ever seen. You could not see inside from the side. It sat there until she went inside then would drive to the end of the road and sit at the church parking lot and wait. Wait until she'd come out again for another smoke, and it would repeat this. Odd, but my sister is a brave lady and just kind of ignored it. That is, until the next day while my parents were out again and it showed up again. It would sit at the end of the driveway and just watch. I don't know what the driver was doing, but he was watching my sister. I know, because if I didn't go out, I'd watch from the front window and it would just sit there and watch my sister. She told my father, who was a sheriff deputy at the time, and he called the cops and made a complaint. They showed up, looked around, but the SUV was nowhere to be seen. Months went by and nothing. Then one day, a good nine months after this had all started and around four months since the last sighting, it was back. It became a regular occurrence. Another day, my sister was outside doing her nasty habit, and sure enough, here it comes. This time we were all alone as usual, and she decides she has had enough. She tells me to stay in the carport, and she's going to go confront them. She starts walking toward the SUV, and halfway down the driveway, she would later remark to us, I felt utter terror, like I knew if I went any further, I was dead. I was paralyzed by pure fear. She turned around and went inside. Finally, the family car was in the shop for some kind of issue, so we were all stuck home for the night. While my parents are home, my sister goes outside to smoke. I go outside with her, and eventually the SUV shows up. She tells me to run inside and tell my father, and I do. My dad promptly gets his gun and starts briskly walking down the driveway with it in hand, in the direction of the SUV, but not leveled towards it. The SUV floored it down the road and peeled out onto the nearby large highway. My dad, being a cop, noted the year and model and distinguishing features. 
the scariest thing. The license plate had been covered in duct tape. We never saw it again. I was just four or five years old and my parents had just separated. My mom was living in a two-bedroom apartment. I had my own room, but I preferred to sleep in her bed whenever I was staying with her. Our two bedrooms were at the end of the hallway, directly across from each other. Our apartment was on the first floor, and I remember that it was in the middle of the summer, and my mom had a window open in her room, which was directly behind the bed above the headboard. Anyways, I woke up in the middle of the night and remember sitting up and seeing that our cat was sitting in the doorframe of my mom's room. I should note her door was open and you could partially see into my bedroom. This was strange because our cat was typically always in bed with us. As I was watching him, he walked into my bedroom and meowed. I turned to face my mom and woke her up. In the three or four seconds it took me to wake her up and ask me what was wrong, we both looked back up at the doorframe and there was a man standing by my open door, making his way out of the bedroom. I still don't know how she managed to do it so quickly but my mother proceeded to pick me up and literally throw me out of the screen window. She quickly followed and we were able to start screaming for help and someone called 911. The police came but didn't see any signs of forced entry, only that our front door was unlocked, which led them to believe that the man must have exited that way. The strange thing was that my mom swore up and down that she had locked the door that night with the deadbolt and chain lock. About a week later, she was cleaning the kitchen and opened up our water heater closet and found a notebook with names and drawings, as well as a pair of gloves and some gum wrappers. The police were called again, but all they could do was speculate that the man had been in our house and hid until we were asleep. One day while doing my laundry, one of the lights blew out in my basement. My basement is set up so that the laundry room is split up from the other side of the basement with a wall and a door. In order to get upstairs, you have to exit the laundry room and go through the other part of the basement. So the light blew in the other part, not the laundry room. As it was the only light on that side, it was pretty dark. I finished the laundry I had to do while dreading the walk through the dark basement. I exit the laundry room, get halfway through the basement, and I hear a loud cackle Imagine a sound people make when they imitate a witch. Take that and imagine the witch had been smoking for 50 years, making her voice deeper and hoarser. <laughs> That's what I heard, clear as day, right behind me. I didn't hesitate to bolt for the stairs. I waited until my father got home and then changed the bulb. I have yet to hear that cackle since, and I have not told a single person in the house about it. This happened to a friend of mine. She told me about it about a year or so ago. We'll call her Minji. Minji is in her late 20s and works as an English tutor in South Korea. One evening, a few years ago, she was tutoring a high school boy. They were up studying pretty late and the buses stopped running. Being a long way from his house, the boy asked if he could crash on her floor overnight and get the first bus in the morning. Minji was very reluctant because inviting a teenage male student to stay the night didn't sound like a great idea, but he was begging her and eventually she relented. They went back into her one-room apartment and she got into the bed while he laid a blanket out on the floor and they both fell asleep. A few hours later, at maybe 2am, the boy wakes Minji up. I'm really hungry, he says. Let's go get some food. Minji opens her eyes and looks up at him in disbelief. Food? Now? It's 2 a.m. Go back to bed. But the student insists. No, I'm so hungry. Let's eat something now. She tells him that there's some ramen in the kitchen and he could fix himself some. This doesn't satisfy him. He doesn't want ramen. There's a 24-hour place just down the road. Let's go there. Eventually, after several minutes of persuasion, the boy gets Minji to come with him to the restaurant. They leave the apartment and head out. As soon as they're on the street, the boy turns to Minji and says, I'm not hungry. I woke up in the middle of the night and looked under your bed. There's a man sleeping there. They call the police and discover that a homeless man had been living in Minji's apartment, sleeping under the bed for two months. The boy only saw him because he was lying on the floor 
so he had a clear view under the bed. I was driving a shortcut from 29 Palms, California to Albuquerque, New Mexico. 29 Palms is located in the desolate high desert east of LA. The shortcut was all two-lane road through total nothingness, except for a passing through Amboy. Amboy is a nearly abandoned town nearly as far below sea level as Death Valley. So I was driving by myself in the afternoon and proceeded to drive up into the mountain range between Amboy and I-40. Once I reach the top, I'm driving north through a canyon with high grass on both sides of the road. Up ahead I see some stuff in the middle of the road. As I approach, I slow down to see a red Pontiac Fiero stopped sideways across both lanes. A suitcase open with clothes scattered everywhere and two bodies laying face down in the road, a man and a woman. I stop a hundred feet or so away and the hair on the back of my neck is standing up. Being a marine, I reach under the seat and pull out a 9mm pistol and chamber around. Something seemed very wrong. It looked too perfect, as if it were staged. An ambush? Something was just wrong. As I scanned the road, I saw a line I could drive. Past the guy in the road on his left, swerve to the right of the woman, behind the Fiero, and I'd be on the other side. I dropped it into first gear punched it down and drove the line I planned. I passed the back of the Fiero without hitting it or either of the bodies in the road. I continued forward a couple of hundred feet and slowed down so I could breathe and let my heart slow down. As I looked up into the rear view mirror, I saw that the two bodies had gotten up to their knees and twenty or so people emerged from the tall grass on either side of the road by the car and bodies. At that moment, my right foot smashed the gas pedal to the floor and did not let up until I had to slow down for the I-40 East on-ramp. I will never know what would have happened to me had I gotten out of the car to check on the bodies or stopped my car closer to them. Some friends and I were doing some night fishing on the James River. We were sitting along the shoreline with a nice fire going, accompanied by the usual idle talk and a few beers, when suddenly, everyone just stopped talking, like a switch was flipped off. We were all staring across the river and felt as if something, or someone, was staring back. It was a very uneasy feeling, to which some of the group tried to shake off with typical macho humor, when a blood-curdling sound erupted from the other shore that froze everyone in their tracks. The sound was unlike any other that I had ever heard, and it made every hair on my body vibrate and tingle. The only way I could describe it is it sounded like a wild person with no language skills being gutted alive. No words, just this high-pitched blood-curdling scream. Nobody moved or said a word. We all just sat there fixed in our stare, when just as suddenly, a second scream was let loose with even more force than the first. By this time, several of us were sprinting to our trucks that were parked a few yards away, retrieving various firearms. When we got back, we all sat there quietly, with our eyes fixed staring toward the opposite shore, watching the light from our fire reflecting off the rocks. We sat there waiting for another scream, or something to move on the other side of the river. Finally, a third scream came just as suddenly, but this time, it was on our side of the river coming from the bushes about a yard away. We all hightailed out of there, leaving most of our stuff behind. When we got to our trucks, we heard the scream one more time, just beyond the tree line. We all floored it the hell away from there and never found out what was making the sounds. It was a Friday night, and my friend was picking me up in his car from my house. I was in a hurry since we were running late for the hockey game in the city. The whole car ride there, we were having such a good time that I hadn't even noticed that I didn't have my phone. I searched the car seat, the floor, but it wasn't in the car. I was sure that I had just forgotten it. 
During the hockey game, I couldn't stop worrying that maybe I had dropped my phone somewhere, so I borrowed my friend's phone and ran to the bathroom. I dialed my number and hoped someone at my house would pick up. It took three rings before somebody picked up, but they remained silent on the other end. I yelled into the phone that I was just checking if I had left my phone at home. They didn't answer. I assumed it was my little brother just messing with me, so I hung up. I got home late that night to see that my parents weren't home. I got inside my house and called them to see where they were. They told me that they had gone out to eat and see a concert at the park with my little brother. They said they left soon after I had for the game, and they should be home in around half an hour. So I hung up and proceeded to look for my cell phone. But then I realized, how could somebody in my family have picked up my phone if they hadn't been home? I felt a pain in my stomach as fear swept over. It was at that moment that I heard the back door to my house open and close. I immediately jolted out the front door to the neighbors and called the police. Apparently, the back door was left open and somebody had simply walked into our house. Nothing was stolen, but the scariest thing is the thought that we could have fallen asleep with a stranger in the house. A while back, there was a family that moved in next door to my family. They had a son who was just twisted. He was obsessive over slasher movies and always wanted me to talk about shit that happened during my time serving in Vietnam that no normal person would want to hear. He also loved tormenting stray animals. This guy was a whack job. He was 19 at the time and my daughter was 7, but he always wanted to talk to her. He'd strike up conversation with her when she walked home from school. He would talk over the fence at her when she was playing in the back. But what really set me off was when he called our house looking to speak to her. That was it. I went over and flipped shit at him and his parents, told him to stay the hell away from her and I'd better not ever see him again. That's when things got weird. My daughter was always a little imaginative and paranoid. She would think there were monsters under her bed and whatnot, so when she told me there was something living in her closet and she was too scared to get up and tell us at night, but it wasn't there in the daytime, we blew it off as no big deal. A few weeks went by and one night my wife and daughter were staying at my mother's for a girls night. So I turned the key on the HBO box and watched me some movies, eventually falling asleep downstairs. At around 2am, I get a call from my neighbor with a creepy son, telling me something along the lines of, We saw that you were up, so we called. Our son is missing. I went by his room to use the bathroom and his door was open, which isn't usual, and there was no sign of him. We need help looking for him. The phone call woke me up though, I wasn't up so I asked why they thought I was. Oh, we saw you walking around upstairs and the light is on. My blood ran cold as ice. I'd been passed out on the couch and I know no one turned any lights on. I hung up on them, ran outside to my truck to grab my shotgun, but noticed the sheriff pulling up to my neighbor's house by this point. I booked it over and told him there was someone in my house, and now I could see the lights in my daughter's room were on and there was a silhouette pacing back and forth. When the deputies went in, they found the neighbor boy there waiting, waiting in my daughter's room with a nice little setup in her closet. He said he liked to watch her sleep in the moonlight. I'll never forget this night. The pizza place I worked at was about to close and I was getting ready to go home when the phone rang. I was working the counter alone that night so I was taking calls. I picked up the phone. There was complete silence so I hung up. About a minute later the phone rings again so I pick up again. Still silence. I was about to hang up again when I heard the very weak and cold voice of an old woman on the other end. She said she wanted a regular pie delivered. I remained polite on the phone, but on the inside I was screaming. I just wanted to get home and end my shift. I called out to my boss that somebody is requesting a delivery. He told me I had to go. I was upset at first, but 
I realized it's another tip, and the old ones usually tip the most, so I decided it was okay. I took down the address and told her it would be there soon, but she had already hung up. I thought that was rude, but I ignored it and yelled to the chef that I needed one regular. My boss told me to just go home after the delivery as the place would be closed. So a little before 10 o'clock, I got in my car and put the address into my GPS. The house was 7 miles away. The GPS took me to the quiet side of town. I arrived to the house. It was a small, one-floor house on a very quiet and empty block. I took the pizza and walked up to the door and rang the doorbell. There were no lights on in the house. I hoped that she hadn't given me the wrong address. I rang the doorbell again. There was still no answer. I was about to give up when I turned my head and saw somebody standing at the window. I got a little freaked out and backed up at first, but I eventually got closer to the window to see the person. It was an old woman, probably in her late 70s. She was just staring at me with a blank expression. I yelled to her through the glass that I had her pizza. She didn't react to what I said, so I screamed it louder. A big smile ran across her face, not a pleasant, genuine smile. It was a smile that sent chills down my spine. I still remember that exact face she made through the window. I decided that I was freaked out enough and got back to my car and set the pizza in the passenger seat. I had to text my boss about this. I shot him a quick text and started my car, ready to get the hell away. I looked to my right to get one more look, to see the woman standing right outside my passenger side window, giving me the same stare she had given me before. I put my car in drive and floored it down the street, not looking back. My boss never made me do a late night delivery again. This happened four years ago when I was still in high school. I was told to do my last delivery of my shift. I got in my car, which was a 1999 Camry, perfect for delivering pizzas. I GPS the address of my phone. I live upstate in the country, so all pizza deliveries were long drives. I remember the sun was starting to set, so it was probably around 7 o'clock. I'd say after a good 15 minutes of driving through the foresty dirt roads, my GPS said I had arrived. It was an old little cottage-like house made almost entirely of wood. It was sitting all by itself in the middle of absolutely nothing but forest. The lawn was completely unkept as the grass was almost at knee height. I was used to this kind of thing, so I didn't think much of it. I took the pizza to the front door. There was no doorbell, so I knocked loudly on the door. Within 10 seconds, I heard the sound of footsteps hitting wood on the inside of the house. The footsteps made it to the door and stopped. I started to feel uneasy. I got the feeling that I was being watched. And that's when I noticed there was a peephole in the door. It's the pizza guy, I called out. I heard a low, harsh sounding voice on the other side of the door, telling me to bring the pizza out back. I didn't like the idea of going back there, something didn't seem right. Are you sure sir? I called out. He didn't answer my question. The sound of footsteps didn't move away from the door so I had the feeling he was still watching me. I almost found myself walking back to my car, but I decided I didn't want any trouble with my boss. The last time I brought a pizza back, he gave me attitude, so I reluctantly walked through the uncut grass and around the small house to the back. I remember there was a shed and a little patio back there. In the patio, there was a table with four chairs surrounding it. In one of the chairs facing away from me, I saw the head of somebody sitting in the seat. I began walking over and said, excuse me, but the person didn't even move an inch. Excuse me, I said again louder. Then from behind me, I heard, psst, over here. I turned around to see a man poking his head out from the corner of the house, looking at me with a crazed smile. Come over here, I want to show you something. I freaked out, turned around and ran around the house in the opposite direction, back to my car, for some reason still holding the pizza. I got in my car, started it, and got away from there. On my way back to the pizzeria, I pulled over to the side of the road and called the police. Eventually, I was informed that there was no sign of anybody having been in that house for a long time. 
I quit my delivery job a few days after that. I have no idea what would have happened to me had I gone up to that man, but to this day, I still wish I had just turned my head to see who or what was sitting in that patio chair. I was doing late night deliveries during this particular shift. When I worked this job, I lived in the Poconos. It was very rural up there. I often found myself driving down roads surrounded by nothing but trees, just like this night, only it was dark and foggy this time. Driving down a shortcut to town that I had taken many times before, I slam on the brakes when I see somebody jump out from the bushes onto the road. The sickening bump and thump from the front of the car confirmed that I had hit the person. I put my hand to my forehead, cursing to myself. I couldn't believe what just happened. I just hit a person. I got out of my car and checked to see if they were alright. It was a man wearing a black hoodie with the hood up. He lay motionless by my car tire. I had no idea what to do. At this point I was panicking. Why the hell was this guy in the middle of nowhere? Why did he jump in front of my car? And then things got weirder. I can hear a scream. A scream for help, coming from the woods to the left of me. Somebody was in trouble. I looked at the man I hid with my car. He was still on the ground, motionless. I'd only be gone for a minute, I figured. For whatever stupid reason, I thought it was okay to leave the man behind, to go into the woods. I moved in the direction I heard the scream originally, hoping to hear another. But it was just total silence, except for the night creatures making their sounds. Where are you? I yelled out. It was at that moment I heard the sound of a foot crushing the leaves on the ground. I turned in the direction of the sound, and even in the dark and foggy weather, I could still make out the figure of somebody hiding behind a tree opposite me. I ran as fast as I could back to my car, looking back constantly to make sure I wasn't being followed. When I got back to my car, the man I had hit was gone. I didn't stick around to wonder where he went. I just got back in my car and proceeded down the road. My heart was racing the whole drive through, but I still ended up delivering the pizza. I got to the house and when I rang the bell, a middle-aged woman answered. After paying, I noticed that her eyes focused on something behind me, and then she asked me, they let you guys have delivery partners now? I was confused and asked her what she meant, and she told me, you got someone with you in your car. I felt a pain in my stomach as I turned and saw somebody sitting in the back seat of my car. I called the cops using the woman's phone and they arrived shortly after, but the person in the back seat of my car was already gone. The scariest thing about this whole story, the police found a bloodstained knife on the floor of my car where the man was hiding. This memory still haunts me every day, and I can genuinely tell you, it's painfully scary just to imagine how things could have turned out if I hadn't made the delivery. I remember this just vaguely, since I was little at the time, maybe seven. In my old house, my room had its own floor. It wasn't even supposed to be a bedroom, it was more of an attachment to the attic, or a closet type room. The people that owned the house before us used it as a playroom for their daughters. My room also had a huge closet door that was attached to the attic. The closet was elevated up so that you would have to climb a set of wooden stairs to get into it. It had a big sliding door and it was completely packed with toys and other junk from my childhood. Since I was little at the time, I always got scared of being so separated from the rest of my family and having that huge closet in my room. Then there was this one night, 
I was laying in bed, afraid after watching a scary movie with my family. Then I heard the sound of a toy fall over up in the closet. I jumped out of my bed and ran to my parents' room. They told me there was no one in my closet. They saw how afraid I was, so they let me sleep in their room that night. The next night, I had kind of forgotten about it until I heard it again. The sound of a container of Legos spilling out everywhere up in the closet. Again, I ran to my parents' room and told them about it. My dad was starting to grow impatient with me. He reluctantly agreed to let me sleep in their room again. The next day, me and my mom checked the closet, and there it was. A pile of Legos lay on the floor, spilled out of the container. I thought this was proof that somebody was in my closet, but my mom assured me that it simply fell over. That night, my dad locked his door. He said he was tired of my nonsense. I couldn't sleep that night. I lay there completely silent with my young boy imagination running, waiting for another sound to come from the closet. It was probably about an hour before it happened. It broke the silence. The sound of the closet door rolling open with force. The moonlight shining through my window illuminated the figure standing by my closet door. I let out the most horrific, ear-piercing scream you've ever heard as pure terror swept over my body, a feeling that I still remember today. The figure jumped down from the closet and ran out of my room and out the front door of my house. My mom ran up to my room in shock as my dad ran downstairs trying to catch whoever it was, but he never did. The police never caught the man. When I was in 8th grade, I went on a school trip that was called the Louisiana Tour. It was mostly going around to significant sites in South Louisiana. One of the places we went to was Myrtle's Plantation, which is considered to be one of the most haunted places in the country. There are all kinds of stories about the place, but at one point we were standing in a room as a part of a larger group, and the tour guide was talking about something. I don't remember what. As I'm standing there, I start to hear what sounds like someone hitting a piano key. After I heard it a couple times, I started to look around for the source of the sound. I didn't see a piano, but I kept hearing it, so I asked my friends who were standing near me if they heard it. They said no. When I heard it again, I said there it is again, they must have heard it. They thought I was crazy. So I went back to looking around the room. Everyone's eyes were on the tour guide except for one woman. She caught my eye and pointed at me, and then at her ear with a questioning look. I realized she was asking if I heard it too, and I nodded. At this point the tour guide starts telling a story about a soldier who had died there and that he played the piano, and multiple guests had reported hearing him playing in the night. I honestly didn't know what to think. I guess I still don't. I talked to the woman as we were all leaving the room and she said she heard the exact same thing as me, but her husband and son had not heard it. It was near Halloween time when my friends and I were telling ghost stories. My friend said she was going to tell a story about her parents' first date. She said she didn't like telling the story since it was actually true, but we prodded her on. To cut to the chase, the parents had a nice, if awkward, first date, and around the time that they would have said goodnight, the male in the situation, who was my friend's dad, suggested that they go for a midnight hike up Provo Canyon. He apparently knew the place, since he had done a fair amount of rock climbing in the area. So the two drove up the mouth of the canyon, got out of their cars, and started hiking under just the light of the stars, since it was a new moon. At some point, the man starts getting a bad feeling, since the pathway ahead which would pass under some trees would be dark, and because it was getting quite late. He ignores the feeling and presses on. A minute later, the feeling came back to the man. He ignored it again and started walking a bit of the way into the trees when his foot hit something soft in the middle of the path. Under the trees it was too dark to see just what this soft thing was and the feeling came back stronger than ever. Instead of finding out what his foot had bumped into, he and the woman both agreed to hightail it out of there. Years later, after being married for some time, they were watching an interview with the serial killer Ted Bundy. In response to a question asking him to describe the time that he felt the closest to being caught, he explained about the night that he lured a girl into Provo Canyon and had just killed her when he heard some people coming up the trail. He explained how he hid in the trees just in time 
only to watch some guy walk right into the body and for some reason, just turn around and walk away. My school's library is open until 2 in the morning for the idiots like me that don't do their essays until the last minute. It's a pretty small building and most of the books are in the basement area called the Stacks. Just to give you a quick layout, there's the big main stairs that go down to the Stacks, a vending machine room, and the long hallway with the four entrances into the Stacks. The Stacks are two really big rooms on opposite sides of the hallway with a huge amount of bookshelves and study desks lining the walls. I was there around 11 p.m. last year. It was a pretty research-intensive essay, so I was down in the stacks working in one of the study desks, so I didn't have to keep going upstairs and downstairs again. I had been there for maybe two hours, and everyone except for a boy working a few desks down from me had already left. I was pretty zoned out by this point. It was an 8 a.m. class, so I didn't have much time until it was due, and I was sort of panicking. So it really pissed me off when I heard someone flipping through book pages really fast to make them do that loud whipping noise at the other end of the room. I sort of ignored it for a while, thinking they'd go away eventually, but they just kept doing it. After about five minutes, I got sick of it and started to walk over to tell them to knock it off. I get about three steps across the room and it just stops. I sat back down and it was quiet again, only for like ten minutes before the flipping pages noise started again only loads louder, like they'd grabbed a huge book that time. The boy started to get pissed off too and he stood up and started walking around through the bookshelves trying to find them. It kept going so I got up too and started looking around with him. It got really loud and it was pretty obvious where it was coming from by that point, so he started walking towards it. He was on one side of the shelves and I was on the other. We walked all the way down the shelves. No one there. We hadn't seen anyone come in the stacks and we were on the side of the room with the entrances. No way could anyone have come in without us seeing them. The noise stopped again and we both sort of just slowly walked back to our seats. I assumed it was just a fan or something in the other room and I really needed to get my essay done. We sat down and immediately the noises started again. It sounded like it was coming from right next to the guy's chair. He shoved his stuff in his bag, looked at me said, fuck this, and took off. I was out of there maybe five seconds behind him. I still won't go back in the stacks at night, even when there's other people down there. This happened when I still had my fishing boat. It was a horrifying experience that will never leave us. Me and my wife departed from the East Coast for our two-day fishing trip in the North Atlantic. The first day and night were normal. We got a decent catch. At night we played cards while listening to music. It was enjoyable up until the next night. After a slow day at sea, we were playing cards again inside, this night without the music. It was at that moment that we heard the sound of a boat motor. We rushed outside to see a man piloting a crappy old motorboat with absolutely no lights on. He had stopped directly in front of our bow. The man was middle aged, he had a beard and a baseball cap on. I went up closer and asked him if he needed help. He asked us if we had any spare gasoline. I apologized and told him we didn't. I asked the man if he was low on fuel and if he needed a ride back to the shore, but he declined. He claimed he had plenty of gas, which brought an awkward silence as me and my wife wondered why he asked us for gas then. The silence started to creep me and my wife out, mostly because of the way he just blankly stared at me. The only reason I could see was because of the deck light in the front of our boat. Other than that, we were surrounded by darkness. The man finally broke the silence and asked us if we had a good catch that day. I told him we didn't, still trying to be polite, even though the situation was odd and creepy. I asked the man how he was getting around in the darkness, but all he gave me was a chuckle, as if I had made a joke. I figured he misheard me. He turned his little motorboat around and the last thing he said to us was, Nice meeting you folks. He sailed off into the total blackness surrounding us. Me and my wife were completely weirded out. My wife told me she was afraid he was going to rob us. Being a fisher, you run into and make conversation with other sailors and fishers all the time, but I knew something about that guy was off. The fact that he came up to us so late at night, so far from the shore and alone in that little motorboat, and the way he acted... 
We were both really uncomfortable, so I decided to turn out our lights and sail a bit north just to make sure the guy couldn't find us again. Call me paranoid. Later that night, probably around two in the morning, I woke up to the disturbing and ear-piercing scream of my wife. I shot up from my laying position to see a man standing at the edge of our bed. I lunged out of the bed towards the man, but he was out of the cabin before I could even get out of the room. I heard the sound of the same motorboat starting before speeding away into the darkness again. We sailed all the way back to the shore that night and reported the man right away. Of course, nothing was ever heard of the topic again. We still have no idea what the man wanted or what he was planning on doing, but it still gives me nightmares to this day. The way my bedroom was laid out was that across the room from my bed, there's a small alcove that does not receive any light because of the closet that's slightly in front of it. So the closet blocks the ceiling light and the ambient light from outside when it's dark. I was in fourth year high school and was trying to sleep but couldn't. You know that feeling like someone's staring at you? I was feeling it. I couldn't shake it and it just felt like whatever was staring at me had such malicious intent in it. I opened my eyes and my gaze was drawn to that dark corner of the room where I saw a hazy darker outline in it. I got goosebumps, but thought that it was nothing there. I'm just imagining things. I closed my eyes again, trying to force myself to get sleep, but I can't shake that evil feeling stare. Then there was a creak sound, the sound from somebody putting pressure on the floor. I opened my eyes again and that shadow thing was in the opposite corner now. All my inner senses went ballistic and I threw my pillow and blanket over my head as I cried myself to sleep, all while hoping that the thing wouldn't come closer. I know I didn't imagine or dream it, and it still sends chills down my spine to this day. It was the first time my family ever went camping together. I was 18 at the time. We probably wouldn't have gone if it weren't for my brother and sister who were still only 11 and happened to be twins. It was mid-July and I was actually excited to do it. We drove all the way out to the country. We didn't go to a camping site, my dad just parked the car on the side of a quiet road and we hiked about a mile into the woods until we found a small clearing in the woods. We pitched our two tents, one for me and my siblings and one for my parents. So come nighttime, I couldn't sleep at all. Trying to fall asleep in that sleeping bag was like trying to fall asleep on the grass. I just couldn't get to sleep. I spun around and tried to make myself comfortable for hours. My little brother and sister had been asleep for a long time at that point. And then I heard the sound of the zipper to the tent zipping down. I looked up and saw someone poking their head into the tent. I couldn't see who it was. Dad? I whispered. Whoever it was removed their head from the inside of the tent. Dad? I said louder. Whoever it was quickly moved away from the tent, leaving it unzipped. I was so confused. I was sure it was my mom or dad just checking on me. So I crawled out of the tent and walked over to my parents' tent. I unzipped it and crawled inside. My parents were both in their sleeping bags. I shook my dad until he woke up. I asked him if he had just checked on us. He said no. I got chills as he said it. I then woke up my mom hoping that it was her, but she groggily told me that she hadn't left the tent either. I got goosebumps all over as I came to the realization that somebody actually came up to our tent, opened up the zipper, and peered inside. A stranger. For all I know, some sort of psycho. I couldn't even really tell if my parents took me seriously or not, or maybe I just don't remember but I do remember that I didn't get a minute of sleep that night. My parents were on their honeymoon to Key West. When they arrived at the hotel to check in, they were told that the room would be non-smoking. With my dad being a smoker, they requested a different room. They got the room switch and went to their room. As they got off the elevator, the smell of fresh paint was overwhelming. Down the hall there was a painter with all necessary supplies laid out around him as he was painting the wall. As my parents walked past him, they casually greeted him and the painter had absolutely no acknowledgement of their presence. Whatever. 
When they got to their room, the smell of paint was even worse in there. So bad it wasn't even bearable, so they decide to go to the front desk to change rooms. When they explained the situation, the attendant looked very confused and informed them that there wasn't a scheduled paint job on that floor for that day, but agreed to change their room anyway. My parents go back to their floor to grab their luggage and the painter is completely gone. All supplies cleaned up and gone within 10 minutes, and the smell of paint was completely gone. At this point, my parents were freaked out, but didn't think much of it and went to their new room. The next morning on their way to breakfast, they overhear a tour guide talking to a group. My parents tuned in when the guide mentioned the floor that they were originally supposed to stay on. Apparently a long time ago, there was a painter on that floor painting and fell down the elevator shaft to his death. Now my parents don't normally believe in the paranormal, but after an event like this that they had no explanation for, it freaked them out a good bit. This story didn't happen to me, it happened to my cousin, and yet it still freaks me out thinking about it. This story is all too true. My cousin Nikki was on Skype with his girlfriend Sam at around 1 in the morning on a Friday night. She was asking him to come over and stay the night, but he didn't really want to drive over that late. Sometime into the conversation, Nikki noticed the closet door behind Sam open a crack. Nikki pointed it out, and Sammy turned and looked at the closet. They both ended up ignoring it. It was probably another half hour into the conversation that the closet door creaked open even more. Nikki spotted it again and told Sam that her little brother must be hiding in the closet. She denied it and told him the window was open or something, so there must have been a draft. It was about half an hour later that the closet door completely opened and somebody stepped out of the closet and walked out of Sam's bedroom. Sam didn't seem to notice, but Nikki got startled from what he just saw. He told her that her little brother was hiding in her closet, but what she said next scared Nikki shitless. She told him that she was home alone that night. Nikki started yelling at the screen for her to lock her door and call the police and that he would be over there as fast as he could. Sam just started to understand the situation as she turned and saw the closet door completely open. She ran over to her doorway and let out a blood-curdling scream before slamming the door shut and locking it. Nikki drove over as fast as he could while calling the police. When he got there, the front door was left open so he ran into the house into Sam's room. He knocked on the door and told her it was him, but she wouldn't answer. When the police finally arrived, they busted open the door to find her curled up in the corner of the room in shock. She later told the police that she had seen somebody standing face to face with her at the doorway before shutting the door. It was a dark and stormy night, the kind of stormy that I loved, thunder and lightning roaring, so I was staying up late watching movies. I lived with my dad, but he wasn't home that night, he was working nights. Anyway, after I finished watching the movie Forrest Gump for the hundredth time, I decided 2am was a good time to get some shut eye. I loved going to sleep during thunderstorms. It was just enjoyable to listen to, but suddenly, I heard the sound of something hitting my window. It wasn't the sound of rain hitting the window, but in such a big storm I didn't think much of it and put my head back down. But a few seconds later, the same noise, something hits the window again. This time I made the sound out to be a rock hitting the window. My heart started racing. It couldn't be my dad, he would, he would call if something was wrong. Another rock hits the window. I found myself glued to my bed. I didn't want to look out the window, but whoever was outside surely knew I was up there. I had just turned the TV off. They could have seen the bright glare through the window. I just decided if I ignored it, they would go away. Another rock hit the window, and then another. It was getting faster. The rain started to lighten up, and that's when I heard the sound of a truck engine running down in the street. A much louder thump to the window was where I drew the line. I got out of my bed planning to call the cops. I ran down the stairs towards the phone, but as I passed the front door, I saw something. Something through the glass window at the top of the door. 
It was the face of a person looking through to me. It seemed like they had a smile on their face. I sprinted to the kitchen and called the police. They said there was an officer nearby and they should be there shortly. Whoever was at the door started fiddling with the doorknob and eventually ramming into it, trying to bust it open. I grabbed a knife for protection and yelled that the police were coming before running back upstairs to my room. After about a minute, the ramming to the door stopped and there were no more rocks hitting my window. I still didn't dare to look out the window, but I remember hearing the sound of the truck drive off. A few minutes later, I heard the sound of a police siren outside, and moments later, the doorbell rang. I explained everything to the officer. I described the face as best as I could. Unfortunately, I couldn't provide him any information about the vehicle. If only I had looked out the window. I still regret not taking a quick look. There was never enough info for the police to catch these people. Not sure if they had intention of robbing my house, or much worse. Number 4. This happened during a Boy Scout campout when I was 15. My friend who was supposed to share the tent with me called out from the trip at the last minute, so that meant I had to pitch the tent and sleep in it alone. The sun was going down and after a long day of hiking, we got back to camp to set up our tents. It was already dark at that point and I was still trying to set it up. It wasn't as easy doing it yourself. Someone came over and finally helped me, and then we ate dinner. After the cliched telling of scary stories around the campfire, we all went to sleep. I guess I was a little happy that I had my own tent at that point since I had more room. I fell asleep quickly, but woke up in the middle of the night to the sound of somebody stomping around my tent. I immediately assumed it was another scout going to take a leak or something. You may be thinking that all our tents were pitched right next to each other, but our scoutmasters actually had us pitch our tents far apart, so I was pretty far from my closest scoutmates. The stomping around the tent seemed to just be going around in a circle, so at that point I was sure somebody was messing with me. I asked who it was, and in response to that, they stomped off into the woods. I almost found myself going out and following them, but I figured it wasn't worth it and just tried to fall back asleep, but after that it was hard to. Sure enough, the stomping came back and started circling the tent again. I was pissed off now, so I got up and unzipped the door to the tent. I was expecting to see another scout, but when I confronted the person making the noise, instead I saw a grown man, probably 6 foot 5, in his mid 30s. My heart was racing and I couldn't even gather up the courage to scream. The man gave me a creepy smile and then brought his finger to his lips, signaling for me to be quiet. I did a quick 180 and sprinted to my scoutmaster's tent, screaming like a baby. He ran out before I even reached the tent and I told him about the man I saw. He and the other scoutmaster ran over to my tent with one of the hunting rifles, but they didn't find the man. They did, however, pick up on the tracks the man left walking around the tent. We were all told to bring our tents closer together, like literally right on top of each other. The trip was cut short the next day and we all went home. I have never gone camping since, and I never will again. Number 3 So me and a couple of my buddies went camping last summer alongside the Willamette River, we actually had a decent hike into the deep end of woods. We did some night fishing, listening to music, and basically drank to the point where everything was funny later in the night. I would guess we finally called it a night somewhere past 2am. I shared a tent with one of my buds while the other two shared another tent. We heard them laughing about something. At first we laughed at the sound of their laughing, but it soon got annoying and we yelled for them to shut up. One of them responded, it isn't us. I sat up, startled at the response. I came to realize that it was the sound of only one person laughing, and it didn't sound like either one of my friends. Even in my drunk state, I realized how odd it was for somebody to be out this far in the woods so late at night. The laughing gradually got closer and louder to our camp out. My friend shot up and looked at me with a worried look on his face. I heard my other friends scream over to us that they were getting freaked out. As the laughing got even closer, I could make it out very clearly to be the laugh of a male, 
probably in his 30s or 40s. He sounded like he was as drunk as us, messing around with friends, but we only heard his laugh, nobody else. There was something indescribably creepy about his laugh too, as if it was missing something to it. You had to be there to understand what I mean. The laughing was now just at the edge of our campsite. <laughs> but we couldn't hear any footsteps at all. Now that may not seem like a big deal. It was impossible to move through that without making noise. And finally, all of a sudden, the laughing stopped completely. We had no idea where whoever that was was standing, as he hadn't made a single stepping sound. We sat there in silence looking at each other. My friend was clearly freaking out, but he was keeping it together the best he could. Finally, something broke the silence. The sound of something rubbing against the cottony fabric of the tent. We saw the outline of a hand through the moonlight, pressing on the tent. We both screamed at the top of our lungs before getting out of the tent. We ran as fast as we could through the woods, our other friends following us. After about five minutes of running, we somehow found our car. I actually puked from running so much before taking the wheel. I don't condone drinking and driving, but I still believe we were just in this situation. By far the most horrific experience of my life. No idea who or what the hell that was, or what they wanted. Number 2 After college, I went backpacking in the Canadian wilderness for a few weeks by myself. To put this in perspective, I was in the middle of nowhere. The nearest town was a 3 hour bus ride away, and I only saw one other person who was from a distance he was in a canoe during the entire 7 days. I brought a few disposable cameras with me, as this was before digital cameras were too widespread. I took a lot of pictures. When I got home I had them developed and took a look at them. The pictures were standard nature shots, until I got about halfway through my first camera. There were two pictures of me asleep in my tent in my sleeping bag. I literally freaked out when I saw it, and I had a complete breakdown. To this day, I have no idea how those pictures got taken. I haven't been camping since, and I sleep with my door open and my curtains shut, and I still get the paranoid feeling that whoever took those pictures is still watching me somehow. Number 1 My boyfriend and I decided to go out to the gorge for some quality time camping. We had always gone with several other people, but this was the first time it was just us two. When we got out of our car to prep our gear for the mile hike back to the camping spot, two sketchy looking dudes came out of the trailhead, eyed us, and went back onto their old school Volkswagen camper van. I had a weird feeling but shrugged it off and proceeded back to our camping spot. I had previously camped in the same area a handful of times and I knew it pretty well. Once we got back there I knew of a handful of different camping spots and proceeded to check them all out for the one that would be ideal for us. I noticed what looked like someone camping further up the hill, so I picked a spot a little further down where we'd most likely be out of sight. Not out of earshot though, as I heard him yelling with someone else back over on the trail. It was starting to get dark by the time we got everything set up, so I figured I'd start looking for firewood. Suddenly, this guy appears out of nowhere and asks us if we'd like any help and offered to sell us a bundle of firewood for 10 bucks. I laughed because we were in the woods, thus surrounded by wood which I could pick up off the ground for free. He then said that I wouldn't find much because they'd already cleared it out over the past few weeks. Few weeks? I asked him how long he'd been camping up there and he said almost a month. I already had the creeps about him and he claimed he was up there by himself. I asked him why I heard him yelling with someone then and that he had referred to more people when he was talking about the wood. He stammered and was like, uh, well, uh, yeah, there's there's some dudes I know camping over there but up on the other side of the river. Then he proceeds to tell us that he's been lonely since he arrived. He was from Pennsylvania, took a bus to Lexington, and had been living in the woods back behind where I currently work. I knew exactly where he was talking about, because I saw some homeless people, immigrants, and drug addicts coming in and out of those woods every day. So basically, he was a homeless man who somehow got a ride out to the gorge and decided he would just live there instead. He had been living on snakes, bugs, and selling firewood for money. But he said we were the first people he'd seen in a few weeks. His stories were all over the place, and I knew he was lying about a lot of what he told us. He wasn't alone even if he claimed to be. 
He even took us to his camp where there were tons of stuff for several guys, not just one. He said he liked camping up top where he could see everything, and every one. Then showed up our campsite. He had a straight shot view. By now it was dark and he helped us get a fire going. I was trying to politely get him on his way back up the hill so I could have a minute to process all of this. When he left, I started whispering to my boyfriend that there was no way in hell I could sleep with that lying, sketchy, homeless creep right up the hill. We didn't have a gun, knife, or even a dog to protect ourselves if we needed to. My boyfriend somehow convinced me to stay a little longer, so we planned to stay the night. But all throughout the night, we heard twigs and branches snapping around our tarp as if somebody was watching us. It was that man. I knew it was. He was standing out there, watching us. I said let's quietly get our shit together and get the hell out of there, which we did, only we left our new tarp set up because they would make too much noise and he'd know we were leaving. As soon as I stood up with my pack, ready to get the hell out of there, he yells, Leaving so soon? We proceeded to get away from there as quickly as possible. The most disturbing thing, as we were getting away from there, the man yelled for us to come back. That only made us go even faster. In my mind, we were either getting robbed, raped, killed, or something, because he was not alone. His stories didn't add up, and his background of where he came from made me believe he was running from something and was trying to hide by living off the grid. I called the rangers the next morning and told them about him. Luckily all he got from us was a set of new tarps. This happened to my dad when he was a little kid. I think it messed him up a bit emotionally, but he never admitted it. The story freaks me out just imagining it. So I'm pretty sure my dad was 10 years old and he was home alone for whatever reason. He was watching TV in the living room. It was the only TV in the house. And all of a sudden, the TV just shut off. So he got up and turned it back on. It was an old shitty TV, so it wasn't weird at all. When he got back on his couch, it happened again. He got up once again and turned the TV back on. And again it turned off. He repeated this process a couple more times before he started to look for the remote. While looking for the remote, he walked over to check behind one of the couches and saw a man hiding in the corner, holding the TV remote. My dad described the man as having long, messy hair and a crazed look in his eyes. He gave my dad a smile and my dad ran out the front door screaming like a little girl. He went to his neighbors who called the police. The man was still in the house when the police got there, so he was arrested. My dad told me that he still assumes the man was either homeless or crazy. Either way, this story is downright terrifying. My friend told me about something that happened to her when she was younger, about eight or nine. She was walking home from school and got her key out to let herself into the house. Her single mom worked and came home later on weekdays. As she reached up to put the key in the door, her mom opened it in a dressing gown having left work sick. Instead of greeting her, she looked straight past my friend and immediately said, Who are you? My friend turned around and a man in a long coat hurried back down the path and down the street. Being ill that day had possibly saved her daughter from something potentially horrible happening to her. Before I start this story, I want to note that Jacob's mother is a drug addict, and his father really didn't have much wrong with him outside of being with his mother. So one night, when Jacob and his father were asleep, they heard a series of loud banging, scratching, and moving noises coming from the mother's room. Jacob's father jumped out of the bed and ran down the hall and started slamming on the door. His mother opened it, yelling at him to quiet down and that he woke her up. He asked her about the sounds. She hadn't been awake to hear them. Jacob's dad would have assumed that she was on something again, but something was wrong. 
the window was open all the way, and the TV was moved across the room, still plugged in, and had the screen facing outside. Jacob's dad was reasonably scared. He shut the window, got his bat, locked the mother's room from the outside, and made her sleep in the living room. He stayed up most of the night. He woke up Jacob at 5. It was still dark out. Jacob went out to the kitchen where his mother already was. A couple minutes later, his dad walked in, wide-eyed. He pointed at Jacob and his mother and held his finger to his lips. They both quieted down. They heard something shuffling around on the roof, going from edge to edge. Jacob's dad had the bat. They sat together in the room, quietly. Minutes later, the sound went away. Jacob's grandmother was called. She was asked if everybody could stay over there for a little while. She said yes and told them she'd come pick them up. Jacob finished eating and went to go sit on the couch. There was no TV in that room, so he sat in silence. He looked over at a door to an empty room in the hallway. The door was open. There was a finger wrapped around the side of it. Jacob screamed and pointed to it, and his father grabbed him and ran out. Jacob's mother followed behind. They went to a gas station and sat out front until they saw Jacob's grandmother's truck. Jacob described how unnatural the finger looked to me. He said it reminded him a little bit of a foam finger in length and width. It was wrapped clear around the door frame, the door itself being latched on the opposite side. They didn't go back to that house much after that. Once they'd gotten everything out of it, they never went back again. Nothing was stolen, and the window in the empty room was open. I was 13 years old. I had the most isolated bedroom imaginable. Mix that with a wild imagination, and I was often up late at night, scared and paranoid, unable to fall asleep. My bedroom was a separate floor of the house, on the opposite side of my parents' room. They had no way of hearing what was going on in my room. So it was a seemingly ordinary night, with a bit of rain, but not a storm. I woke up and looked at my clock, and saw that it was 2 in the morning. I got an uncomfortable feeling right away, but I didn't know why. I then saw at the edge of my bed, there was a shadow of something roundish just over the head of the edge of my bed. My heart started racing until I realized it was just my hat. I sometimes hung my hat on one of the wooden poles at the edge of my bed, so I calmed myself down and fell back asleep. I woke up again around half an hour later and was again startled by the sight of the shadow at the end of my bed. But after my brain started to fully wake up, I remembered it was just my hat again. This process happened one more time that night, probably another half hour later, and once again, I was startled by the sight of the shadow. I was getting thirsty, so I reached my hand down to the side of my bed, looking for my water bottle, but I instead found something else. My hat. And at that instant, I felt my heart drop into my stomach as I almost fell out of my bed trying to turn the lamp on. The light revealed the face of a man, peering over the edge of my bed, staring right into my eyes. I let out the highest pitched scream a boy could possibly produce, and ran straight past the man and down the stairs of my room. I felt the man try to grab me, but I managed to open the door and run to my parents' room to get my dad. My dad got the baton from under his bed and raced to my room, but he was too late. When we got back to my room, the window was wide open. Apparently the man jumped out onto the patio roof outside my window. When I was a kid, I had a huge group of friends that all happened to be on my block. On the weekend nights, we would always play manhunt, aka hide and go seek for older people. It worked out great because since we were all neighbors, we used all the front and backyards and even the woods behind our houses. We had a rule though that we couldn't go out more than a backyard's length into the woods. I always used the same hiding spot, and nobody ever found me. I always hid behind an old rusty barrel that was thrown into the woods years ago. So on this particular night, there were only six of us playing. My friends Joe and Raj were on my team. We quickly dispersed as we were the first to hide. I ran to my usual hiding spot, through my backyard into the woods behind the barrel. Usually I would see the flashlights of the other team shining through the backyards in the woods, but it was unusually quiet this time. And then, I finally heard footsteps nearby. 
I didn't see a flashlight, so I assumed it was one of my teammates. I whispered Joe and Raj's names, but then whoever it was started charging at me, full on sprinting. I immediately shot up and ran out of the woods to find a new hiding spot in my backyard, but nobody ever came out of the woods. I heard all my friends calling my name from out front, including Joe and Raj, so I assumed something was wrong and went up front. I saw Joe's parents talking with my parents, with all my friends surrounding. My parents seemed a bit relieved to see me, so I was naturally really confused. They told me that a police officer had just passed by and warned them about a serial rapist spotted in the area and that all the kids should stay indoors. I explained what happened to me in the woods, and my parents started freaking out, making 100% sure that I wasn't lying. They called the police. I really don't know if he was ever caught, but I really hope he was. I try not to think about what would have happened to me, had whoever that was caught me. When I was maybe 12 or 13, me, my mom, my stepdad, and two dogs went to the beach for a weekend. We rented an apartment all the way at the back of the shore. The apartment had nothing surreal to it at first sight. We unpacked everything and went out for dinner straight afterwards. We came back and at the time it was maybe 9pm. We watched some TV for an hour or so. My mom, stepdad, and two dogs slept on a bed you could make from the couch. They gave me the bedroom with a king-sized bed. I went to bed and used my computer for a while to play some games that I had pre-installed since I knew that there would be no internet connection there. I stayed up playing games pretty late at night. I decided it was time to get some shut-eye and go to sleep. Maybe after five minutes of laying in my bed, complete silence filled the room. But then... All of a sudden, I hear this extremely loud sigh. <sighs> I knew it wasn't my parents or the dogs considering the door to the living room was closed. I straight bolted from that room and went to sleep in the bedroom opposite of the master bedroom. My heart was pounding so fast because I was absolutely petrified. Needless to say, no sleep was had that night. I told my parents about it the next morning and they told me it was probably just my imagination but I was certain it was not. This story still gives me nightmares to this day. I was staying with one of my best friends in North Carolina where I had a job interview. I was coming from New Jersey and my friend Mike offered to let me crash at his place for a few days. He didn't necessarily live too close to the company I was interviewing for, about two hours away, but I also just wanted to see one of my good friends again. So this happened after the second interview. I came back to Mike's place in a good mood as I had been offered the job on the spot. We celebrated in the yard that night with a few friends and a few beers, or a lot of beers. We stayed up late and basically got shit-faced. People were coming and going all night, that's the kind of person Mike is. He didn't really keep track of who entered and left his house. So at about 4 in the morning, after everyone had left, we called it a night. I struggled to make it up the stairs into the bathroom. I drained the snake and soaked my face with hot water, and it was at that moment that I thought I could see something in the corner of my eye. I turned to the half-open door and saw an eye poking in at me through the crack of the door. I let out a loud, holy shit, and in my drunk and klutzy state, I fell to the floor. When I got back on my feet, the eye was gone. I stumbled out of the bathroom and called Mike's name. I heard him call out in response from downstairs in the kitchen. It couldn't have possibly been him. I didn't hear anyone go down the stairs. But I asked if he was up there anyway. Expectedly, he replied with a no. I can't remember fully, but I assume I just brushed it off under the assumption that I had too much to drink. I made it to the guest bedroom and basically fell onto the bed, barely managing to throw the covers over myself. You know when you're drunk you fall asleep easier. That's an understatement. I think I fell asleep seconds after falling onto that bed, only to wake up after an unknown duration of sleep. I immediately felt the unbearable headache coming on, and began to rub my head. It was probably a little before sunrise. The room was a bit chilly. My foot was sticking out of the covers, hanging over the edge of the bed. And then it happened. I felt something extremely cold grab onto my foot and start stroking it. I then heard a raspy voice whisper the words, Can you help me? 
I sat up and screamed at the top of my lungs before sprinting out of the bed and out of the room, meeting Mike at the top of the stairs. I called the police and they arrived shortly. The intruder was actually a woman, a woman in her late 40s who clearly suffered from some kind of addiction. She admitted to simply walking right into Mike's house and hiding in a closet. The eye I saw was hers, peeking at me while in the bathroom. I always make sure to cover my feet with my sheets now. It was the dead of winter in Cali. Me and a couple buddies were on a skiing trip by South Lake Tahoe. We stayed in a big luxurious log cabin for a few nights. On the third night during a blizzard, I got up to get a glass of water late in the night. As I crossed the cabin over to the kitchen, there was a frantic knock at the door. I was a bit spooked that somebody would be knocking this late. I thought maybe I should just ignore it and let them go away. But I realized they knew we were there as my car was parked right outside. I also had the thought that maybe somebody was in trouble and needed to get out of the dangerous weather. I tiptoed over to the door and waited for another knock. It didn't take too long before the knocking came again, this time much louder and more frantic. Who is it? I asked. Nobody answered. I asked again louder, but there was still no answer. After I asked this, there was no more knocking. I grew curious and eventually opened the door a crack with the chain lock still on just in case. Nobody was outside. I undid the lock and opened the door completely. There were footprints in the snow leading away from the cabin. For whatever stupid reason, maybe I felt some kind of guilt and worry for a person in need. I slipped on my boots and jacket and stepped out into the storm to follow the footsteps before they were completely filled. The footsteps led me to the edge of the property before completely stopping. I shit you not, the footprints completely ended, not a sign of vehicle marks, a struggle, nothing. It was as if whoever made the tracks was standing still, right where I was. I felt disturbed and ran back into the cabin and slammed the door shut behind me, making sure to lock it. Before I could even gather my thoughts, the frantic knocking at the door resumed. My heart started pounding and I started to scream for my friends. One by one, they all rushed down to see what was wrong. When we opened the door, there was nobody there. The footprints were already filled. I never could prove what happened to my friends. I don't blame them for not believing me. I almost don't believe myself, but I know it happened. I just can't even try to explain it. It still freaks me out to this day. My friend and I were going to a party a few hours out of town, so we decided to stay at her family's holiday house about an hour south of the party. We arrived around mid-afternoon and it was winter in a holiday town, so the area was completely empty, no other cars on the street. When we left for the party I spent a moment deciding whether to pull the gate all the way closed. I'd had some trouble opening it earlier when we arrived, and if we were getting home late at night I didn't want to be stuck outside. I ended up deciding to shut it for security. The party was great, we got back to the house around 12.30, and the gate was open. I immediately felt on edge because not only did I know that I had locked it, but I knew it couldn't just blow open in the wind. But I didn't want to make a big deal so I was vague when my friend asked me if I would shut it. We went inside and decided to make a snack. I was wandering through the house when suddenly my friend raced from the kitchen into the hallway and virtually tackled me to the ground. She was convinced she'd heard someone walking around outside. We tried to calm ourselves down, but we had no cell reception and there was no one else around. Over the next half hour or so, as we sat in the hallway paralyzed with fear, we heard footsteps outside and the back door being jimmied. We decided we had to leave, so we gathered everything up and got ready to make a break for the car. Just as we were at the front door ready to leave, there was a huge bang in the backyard and suddenly what sounded like hundreds of birds started screaming. We legged it to the car, ended up starting it with all our stuff still on our laps. We hadn't bothered to even put in the back seat. As we reversed out the driveway, we saw somebody running up the side of the house towards us. We sped the entire way home, and didn't sleep at all that night. When I was 10 and my youngest brother Ben was only one, 
There was this one weekend that my parents were painting our bedrooms, so we would have to sleep in the basement. There was a pull-out couch down there that turned into a bed, and Ben had an extra crib down there. I was only 10, so sleeping in a pitch-dark basement was very uncomfortable. Somehow, having Ben down there made me feel a bit safer, though. He would wake me up in the middle of the night crying, and for some reason, tending to him made sleeping down there a little less scary. But it was this one time that I woke up to him screaming. Not crying, screaming, like no one-year-old should. I was scared shitless immediately and ran over to him to see what was wrong. He was standing up looking at me, pointing to something. I looked in the direction he was pointing at. He was pointing into the pitch dark boiler room right next to his crib. I felt like a thousand knives just stabbed me in the chest, and even through the heat of the moment, I vaguely remember the faint sound of something falling over in the boiler room, and I felt as if I was being watched in that basement. I grabbed Ben and got the hell out of there as quickly as possible. I have never gone back down in that basement. Number 3. I'm a 22 year old girl. I was looking on Craigslist to buy a couch for my new apartment a month ago. I found something I thought seemed like a good deal. From the pictures, the couch seemed to be in great shape. The seller wanted to be contacted by email. His email was mexicanpoppy666 at hotmail.com. I felt that email was a bit off-putting, but I still went ahead and emailed the man my offer. He responded within five minutes, accepting the offer and asking for my address. I honestly felt uncomfortable with his asking. I did not want a stranger coming to my house. I suggested that I just come to his house to pick it up, but he continually insisted that he come to my house. Eventually I stopped responding, and a day later, he emailed me again, giving me his address. I didn't know if I should go at that point, but it seemed like a steal, almost too good to be true, and according to his address, he didn't live too far. So I got in my van and drove over to the seller's house. I immediately noticed that the house was a bit smaller than all the other houses on the block. When I rang the bell, a middle-aged man wearing a baseball cap answered the door. He gave me a huge smile and invited me in. I was immediately feeling uneasy. He led me into his living room and I saw the couch. Immediately, I saw scuff marks and small tears in the couch. It was not at all in the shape that it appeared in the ad. I commented on this and he just smiled and offered to lower the price. I told him I'm not interested, and here's where things started getting creepy. As I was making my way out of the house, he put his hand on my shoulder and offered to give it to me for free if I was willing to, quote unquote, give something to him. I let out a disgusted gasp and got back into my car. I didn't even look up out the window, I just drove away from there quickly but it doesn't end there. That same night, I was laying in my bed watching TV, when I thought I heard somebody stomping up the steps of my porch. I muted the TV, and was able to clearly hear the sound of somebody fiddling with my front doorknob. I jumped out of my bed and tiptoed over to the front door to look through the peephole, but whoever it was was already gone. And then, I thought I could hear the sound of the gate to the backyard opening and closing, that was when I grabbed the phone and dialed 911. Soon after, I heard the sound of somebody fiddling with the doorknob to the back door of the apartment. I yelled to whoever it was that the police were on their way, and after that, I heard the sound of the gate opening and closing again. They were gone. This was a month ago and nothing has happened since, but I still can't sleep at night. I'm 99% sure it was the man that was selling the couch. He must have followed me home. There was no way it was just a coincidence. I don't plan on using Craigslist anymore, and I'm still trying to find a new apartment. Number 2. I was looking for a car to buy for my son for his 18th birthday. I was searching all the typical car websites, cars.com, eBay Motors. They were all overpriced as expected. Craigslist was the only place to find an actual deal. 
About a week into my search, I found an 03 Toyota Camry. It had 67,000 miles, no accidents, no damage, and good condition for only 3,500. This seems like a steal for such a reliable car with such low mileage. The seller lived about 10 miles from me, which was a reasonable drive when looking for a car. I gave him a call to set up a time to come check it out. The man sounded normal on the phone. He assured me that there were absolutely no problems with the car. He introduced himself as Bob. I brought along 3500 in cash, even though I planned on wiggling down the price as much as possible. I pulled up the dirt road to Bob's property about 15 minutes early. It was a tiny little house with a decent sized property, only because it was a bit far from the nearest neighbors. The garage was open, so I walked over to see if anybody was inside, but except for an unusual amount of car parts, it was empty. The car was nowhere in sight. The only car on the property was an old pickup truck. I went over to the front door to check the house numbers. It was the right address. The doorbell button was missing, so I knocked on the front door. I knocked for exactly five minutes before deciding to give the man a call. So I dialed his number and I heard the sound of a cell phone ringing from inside the house. I was extremely confused at this point. Now I knew I had the right house. I didn't understand why, if he was home, why he wasn't answering. I decided I had to take a peek through one of the windows to see if anybody was inside. Peering through the glass, I couldn't really see much as it was pretty dark inside the house. I saw a very old fashioned dining room set but across from that, I saw somebody standing at the back door of the house, staring outside. I figured that must have been Bob, so I knocked on the window, but he didn't even move. There was no gate or anything to the backyard. It was just a wide open yard, since this wasn't a rural area. I simply walked around the house to the backyard. I didn't understand how he couldn't hear me. When I got to the back door, I made a shocking realization. The figure standing by the door was a taxidermied human being. I ran straight back the way I came and back to my car. I looked up one last time before driving off. The blinds to the window I had peeked into had been shut, but I could see two of the blinds bent open. Somebody was at that window watching me. You can probably guess I had the gas pedal to the floor the whole way home. The whole situation still makes no sense. All the car parts... The fact that there was no Toyota Camry, the taxidermied human being, the fact that there was no car there leads me to believe that whoever that man was wasn't planning on selling me anything, and that also leads to the disturbing thought that I was very close to becoming a lifeless statue staring out that man's back door. Number 1. I was looking to buy the iPhone 5 about a year ago. I found a guy on Craigslist who was selling his for $200. He claimed it was in mint condition and that he wanted to upgrade to the 5C. I didn't know much about how to go about testing a phone to make sure everything works, so I brought my little brother along who knew a lot more than I did. We met halfway at a Dunkin Donuts parking lot at like 10 o'clock at night. Two large intimidating guys stepped out of a black Honda Civic and walked over to us. One of the guys pulled out the phone and showed it to me. It didn't have a scratch on it. My brother took out my SIM card and popped it into this new phone. He did some testing and told me that it works. The guy then asked for 250 even though he originally asked for 200 I lied and told him I only brought 200 and he seemed a bit unhappy with this. I did have 250 but I didn't want to spend more than his original asking price. I kind of figured it was his way of making sure I didn't haggle down the price. I handed the guy the 200 and he and his buddy got back in their car. We got back into my car and I tested out the new phone by calling my girlfriend. I sat testing things around for about 5 minutes. My brother commented on the fact that the two guys hadn't left yet either, but I didn't really care. I started the car and pulled out of the parking lot. My brother then commented that the two guys started their car just as I had. I didn't find it too weird. I drove down the turnpike and eventually stopped at a red light. That's when I noticed the black Honda Civic pull up right behind us in my rear view mirror. I found that a bit weird since I was sure they came from the opposite direction. I continued my drive home, but every single turn we made, they followed 
and close on my tail too. My brother suggested I pull over, but there was no way I was going to do that. I knew those guys were looking for trouble. It got to the point where I was trying to lose them and started driving dangerously. If they needed something, they would call or at least honk their horn, but they were looking for some kind of trouble. I tried something risky to lose them. At an intersection, the light had just turned red. I floored it across the intersection before any of the cars would begin to pass. My brother shouted at me, calling me stupid and crazy, but it worked. They didn't follow. We got home after the extra long drive. My heart was still racing from the intensity of the situation. I was just happy I got a working phone for such a low cost. Later that night, I was playing around with the phone trying to set some things up before going to bed. My parents and brother were already asleep at this point, and just then, the sound of two car doors slamming shut outside interrupted me. I looked out my window, and I felt like my heart completely stopped. The black Honda Civic was parked across the street. I could only assume the two guys were already halfway to our front door. I immediately woke up my dad and explained everything as quickly as possible. He got up, grabbed a baseball bat, and crouched behind the front door. A loud knock came at the front door. My dad screamed at them to go away. One of the guys on the other side of the door claimed to have a gun and said that he would shoot the lock off of the door if he didn't open up. My dad told me to call Joe, our friend who lives two doors down who happens to be a police officer. I called Joe and he said he would be right over and to stay hidden. Here's the part that still scares me to this day. There was the sound of a silenced shot of a pistol. I peeked over and saw a bullet hole in the door, inches away from my dad's head. My dad ran away from the door and we all listened. We heard Joe outside yelling at them to drop their weapons. My dad went outside to help when they lowered their guns. Joe arrested the two assholes. I have to say, this was the scariest day of my life, but it was also the best I had ever felt in my entire life. Number 6. Living Gnome In 2008, a creepy gnome was caught on film in Argentina. Jose Alvarez, who filmed the gnome, reported that they caught the creature on film while larking about in their hometown of General Guaymes, Argentina. He stated, We were chatting about our last fishing trip. It was one in the morning. I began to film a bit with my mobile phone while the others were chatting and joking. Suddenly, we heard something. A weird noise as if someone was throwing stones. We looked to one side and saw that the grass was moving. To begin with, we thought it was a dog, but when we saw this gnome-like figure begin to emerge, we were really afraid. Other locals have since come forward to say that they have spotted the gnome, and the town has been covered in a pall of fear ever since the first sighting. Number 5. The Devil's Footprints on the night of February 9th, 1855, after a light snowfall, a series of hoof-like marks appeared in the snow. These footprints, measuring one and a half to two and a half inches wide and eight inches apart, continued throughout the countryside for a total of over 100 miles and, although veering at various points, for the greater part of their course followed straight lines. Houses, rivers, haystacks, and other obstacles were traveled straight over, and footprints appeared on the tops of snow-covered roofs and high walls which weigh in the footprints path, as well as leading up to and exiting various drain pipes of as small as a 4-inch diameter. There were also rumors about sightings of a devil-like figure in the Devon area during the scare. Many townspeople armed themselves and attempted to track down the beast responsible without success. Recently, on the night of March 12, 2009, more strange marks, corresponding to those left in 1855, were found again in Devon. Number 4. Jeff In September 1931, the Irving family claimed to hear persistent scratching and rustling noises behind their farmhouse's wooden wall panels. 
At first, they thought it was a rat, but then the unseen creature began making different sounds, sometimes spitting like a ferret, or growling like a dog, or gurgling like a baby. The creature soon revealed an ability to speak, and introduced itself as Jeff, a mongoose. It claims to have been born in New Delhi, India, in 1852. According to Vori, the daughter, who was the only person to see him properly, Jeff was the size of a small rat with yellowish fur and a large bushy tail. Jeff variously claimed to be an extra extra clever mongoose, an earthbound spirit, and a ghost in the form of a weasel. He once said, I am a freak, I have hands and I have feet, and if you saw me, you would faint. You'd be petrified, mummified, turned into stone or a pillar of salt. Vori Irving, who took Jeff under her wing, died in 2005. In an interview published late in life, she claimed that Jeff was not her creation. Number 3. James Warson On September 3, 1873, a man named James Warson had accepted a challenge to race in record time from the town of Leamington to the town of Coventry, a 20-mile trek. He had been boasting of his foot skills and then was asked to prove them, so with sporting good spirits, he set about to do just that. Two friends, Hammerson Burns and Barham Wise, followed behind in a horse-drawn carriage. Burns brought along his camera. Warson was never out of their sight and would often turn around while running to exchange some friendly words with the two riders. Running in the middle of the road, Warson suddenly appeared to stumble and pitch forward, having time enough for only one short, piercing scream. Wise later said, it was the most ghastly sound either of us have ever heard. But as Warson pitched forward with that terrible cry, instead of falling to the ground as he appeared to be about to have done, he completely and totally vanished in mid-fall before ever striking the ground. The road itself told the story and Wise took the pictures to prove it. There in the soft dirt were Warson's footprints. They led down the middle of the road, looked as if the runner stumbled, and there they disappeared. A search was called and the locals scoured the area for James. The bloodhounds used in the search were strangely reluctant to approach the spot where Warson disappeared. He was never seen or heard from again. Number 2. August 7th, 1973 will remain a day of mystery and possible tragedy. Several people in New Mexico that day, using CB radios, heard the disturbing cries for help from a little boy. He said his name was Larry, and that he was trapped in a red and white pickup truck. He was with his father who he thinks had a heart attack and was dead. He said that they had been on a rabid hunting trip when his father collapsed on the steering wheel. Larry claimed that the truck had flipped over into a ravine and both doors were jammed shut and he was unable to escape. The boy's signal faded in and out over the next few days and was also heard in California, Wyoming, and Arizona. In a panic, Larry began to flip between channels crying for help. Police began a search and rescue team. One helicopter pilot who was searching the Manzano Mountains in New Mexico for Larry says that he made contact with a little boy calling for help, but he called himself David, not Larry. A family traveling from Missouri was reported missing on August 11th, and they had a son named Larry, but they were eventually found. On August 12th, an army sergeant claimed to have spoken to the boy for three hours, but could not get him to give more information about himself, like his phone number or address, etc. No more contact could be made with Larry. It is presumed his battery died. The search was called off on August 13th. The police stated that there was no concrete evidence. They also say that the boy, if real, may have died sooner than the transmission stopped, and that the subsequent transmissions from different states, some were even heard in Canada, were hoaxes. Many believe it was a hoax, but those who spoke to Larry swear to this day that it wasn't that the emotion and the crying they heard from little Larry was no doubt the real thing. Number 1. On November 29, 1970, a professor and his daughters were hiking in the Isdalen Valley in Norway when they came across the partially charred remains of a young woman. 
she was surrounded by a large quantity of sleeping pills and bottles of gasoline. All the clothing she was wearing had the tags removed and her fingerprints had been sanded off. A dental screening was done, and some of her dental work was done using techniques only found in Latin America. She was eventually traced back to two suitcases at the NSP train station in Bergen. Her luggage contained a prescription lotion with the doctor's name removed and a few pieces of broken glass with partial fingerprints and 500 German marks which is the equivalent of 350 US dollars under the lining of one of the suitcases. They discovered the woman had traveled by train across Europe under nine different names. There were diaries found with her things that contained cryptic notes that the police deciphered were codes listing the places that she had been. Witnesses say she wore wigs as she traveled and spoke several languages such as French, German, English, and Dutch. She stayed at several hotels in Bergen. After checking into each, she would change rooms several times, always requiring a balcony, and would always order porridge with milk for room service. A local man came to the police saying that five days prior to the body's discovery, he came across a very elegant woman while hiking. He noted that she wasn't dressed for being outdoors, much less on a remote hiking trail, and that her face was distorted with fear. He claimed that she attempted to mouth something to him, but was followed closely by two large men in black coats. The man waited 32 years to come public with this story, stating that when he contacted the police, the officer who answered told him, Forget her. She was dispatched. The case will never be solved. A few years ago, something very weird happened with my best friend and I. I was 15 years old. One night I decided to sleep over at my friend's house. After a night of scary movies, we were in the mood to do something exciting. Not far from my friend's house was a demolishing site, a block of houses in a very terrible state that would be demolished the day after tomorrow. The local government would demolish them to make room for new houses. The whole site was fenced in and warning signs saying do not enter hung everywhere. The houses were boarded up by planks. Doors and windows were sealed shut. No one could get in. We decided to go for a walk on the old block and take some random photographs. My friend knew a spot where we could enter the old block. When we walked there, we noticed that every house was boarded up tight so we couldn't get in. We noticed a house with a window on the top floor that wasn't very well boarded up. We could see into the room. We took a photo with a digital camera. Later we went home and took a look at the pictures we made. Suddenly we came across the photo of the window. We saw a woman dressed in a brown raincoat with white skin and black hair as long as we could visibly see. The woman looked very sad. We hadn't seen any woman up there when we took the picture. Moreover, the windows and doors were boarded. We went back to the house to see if that was correct. After investigation, it really was. Everything was tied shut, and there was no woman. This story isn't mine, but rather of my friend from Japan. I'll call him Rita. It happened back when Rita was only about 11 or 12 years old. Rita was a rather attractive kid and had his fair share of admirers. One girl was extreme with her crush though. I'll call her Ayano. Ayano was a lot older than Rita. She was 17. She was an acquaintance of Rita and lived down the road from him. Rita hadn't thought much of her until she started stalking him. Every day and every night, she would be following him one way or another, whether it be in person or online. Rita first started getting the creeps when she would start messaging him over 20 times a day. Stuff like, be safe, are you alright, sleep well, etc. 
This was a little weird, but he overlooked it. Then the messages started getting creepier. Instead of the usual checkup emails, they got more personal. Things like, You should eat your lunch, if he skipped lunch, or I think your sister is hungry, when his little sister was crying. Rita stopped using both his phone and social media at this point, but it doesn't end there. Rita's mother was almost never home, so he was frequently looked after by babysitters. One day, he had a new babysitter. It was Ayano. Nothing was particularly strange as she looked after him and his siblings, but she did get a lot closer to his mother than he would like. One day at school, Ayano approached Rita and told him that his mother would be out of the country for a week, and that she told her to let Rita stay at her house. Rita was hesitant at first. But hey, it was his mother's wish. He couldn't go against that. Ayano told him that his mother had already left, so he could go home with her after school that day. Rita reluctantly agreed and went home with her. When he got there, her parents weren't home. Things get a little blurry here as my friend choked up telling the story, as it still scares him today. He said Ayano would play weird games with him, stuff like family where she insisted she was the wife and he was the husband, as well as things like cops and robbers, and games to see who would get scared first, where she would blindfold him and leave him in a silent room for hours on end. It was five days into staying at her house, and Ayano had gone to her part-time job. She had left the doors locked, and the windows were too high to jump from, so he just stayed in front of the TV, where he saw a chilling news report. It was a missing child report, the missing child being him. Before he had the time to catch the number to call, the TV switched off, and Diana was standing behind him with the remote in her hand. Rita had freaked out, crying and screaming. Ayano held him, but he managed to wiggle from her grasp just in time to open a window and cry for help. Luckily for him, a couple were walking past, heard his cries and called the police. Within an hour, police arrived and found him locked in her bedroom with a blindfold and his hands tied. Due to Ayano still being a minor, Rita is unsure of what happened to her. He says he only remembers the police taking her away while his mother was hugging him. He moved to Australia after this and hasn't seen his kidnapper since, but he still cowers at the sound of her name. About five years ago, I lived downtown in a major city in the US. I've always been a night person, so I would often find myself bored after my roommate, who was decidedly not a night person, went to sleep. To pass the time, I used to go for long walks and spend the time thinking. I spent four years like that, walking alone at night, and never once had a reason to feel afraid. I always used to joke with my roommates that even the drug dealers in the city were polite but all of that changed in just a few minutes of one evening. It was a Wednesday, somewhere between 1 and 2 in the morning, and I was walking near a police patrolled park quite a ways from my apartment. It was a quiet night, even for a weeknight, with very little traffic and almost no one on foot. The park, as it was most nights, was completely empty. I went down a short side street in order to loop back down my apartment when I first noticed him. At the far end of the street, on my side, was the silhouette of a man dancing. It was a strange dance, similar to a waltz, but he finished each box with an odd forward stride. I guess you could say he was dance walking, headed straight for me. Deciding he was probably drunk, I stepped as close as I could to the road to give him the majority of the sidewalk to pass me. The closer he got, the more I realized how gracefully he was moving. He was very tall and lanky and wearing an old suit. He danced closer still until I could make out his face. His eyes were open wide and wild, head tilted back slightly looking off at the sky. His mouth was formed in a painfully wide cartoon of a smile. Between the eyes and the smile, I decided to cross the street before he danced any closer. I took my eyes off of him to cross the empty street. As I reached the other side, I glanced back, and then stopped dead in my tracks. 
He had stopped dancing and was standing with one foot in the street perfectly parallel to me. He was facing me but still looking skyward, smile still wide on his lips. I was completely and utterly unnerved by this. I started walking again but kept my eyes on the man. He didn't move. Once I had put about half a block between us, I turned away from him for a moment to watch the sidewalk in front of me. The street and sidewalk ahead of me were completely empty. Still unnerved, I looked back to where he had been standing to find him gone. For the briefest of moments I felt relieved, until I noticed him. He had crossed the street and was now slightly crouched down. I couldn't tell for sure due to the distance and the shadows, but I was certain he was facing me. I had looked away from him for no more than ten seconds, so it was clear that he had moved fast. I was so shocked and I stood there for some time, staring at him, and then he started moving toward me again. He took giant, exaggerated, tiptoed steps, as if he were a cartoon character sneaking up on someone, except he was moving very, very quickly. I'd like to say at this point that I ran away or pulled out my pepper spray or cell phone or anything at all, but I didn't. I just stood there, completely frozen, as the smiling man crept toward me, and then he stopped again, about a car length away from me, still smiling his smile, still looking to the sky. When I finally found my voice, I blurted out the first thing that came to mind. What I meant to ask was, what the fuck do you want, in an angry, commanding tone. What came out was a whimper. Wh what the fu- Regardless of whether or not humans can smell fear, they can certainly hear it. I heard it in my own voice, and that only made me more afraid. But he didn't react to it at all. He just stood there, smiling. And then, after what felt like forever, he turned around, very slowly, and started dance walking away. Just like that. Not wanting to turn my back to him again, I just watched him go, until he was far enough away to almost be out of sight. And then I realized something. He wasn't moving away anymore, nor was he dancing. I watched in horror as the distant shape of him got bigger and bigger. He was coming back my way. He was coming back my way, and this time he was running. I ran too. I ran until I was off the side road and back onto a better lit road with sparse traffic. Looking behind me then, he was nowhere to be found. The rest of my way home, I kept glancing over my shoulder, always expecting to see his stupid smile, but he was never there. I lived in that city for six months after that, and I never went out for another walk. There was something about his face that always haunted me. He didn't look drunk. He didn't look high. He looked completely and utterly insane. And that's a very, very scary thing to see. In the mid-80s, my mom was a cleaner in Australia. She would clean houses in suburban areas and would sometimes do houses in rural or wine regions. She would leave business cards at the local shops and got most of her business this way, and some through referrals and word of mouth. One day she got a call from a lady who sounded like she was around 60, asking mom to clean her old farmhouse. She made a lot of odd demands, and mom would usually meet clients before taking on new business. In this case, the lady did not want to meet my mom, and said she would leave the keys under the front doormat. Mom agreed mainly because the lady was quite obviously wealthy and was offering to pay mom substantially more than she would reasonably expect. Mom went to the house on a Monday morning and said she already felt unnerved by the long driveway. The house was essentially in the middle of a very large and very empty property. She found the keys and started cleaning. About an hour into the clean, she hears the back door shut. Mom was told no one would be at the house so she immediately felt unsafe. She stood frozen in the kitchen for what she said felt like three or four minutes, although she said it could have been much longer. There was no other car on the property. She wanted to leave immediately, but had two rooms left to do. Both were bedrooms. She said as time passed and she heard nothing else, she decided that perhaps it was nothing, 
or perhaps something had fallen and it wasn't the door after all. She walked up the hallway and stepped into the bedroom. All over the bed were black and white photos. As mom got closer, she realized that the photos were all of her. Some were taken at our family home and others were taken at other houses mom would clean. Some through windows or over fences. She used the house phone to call the police and immediately drove to the end of the driveway. The lady ended up being investigated, but continued to claim that it was a break-in. After some time, the police stopped with their searching and we ended up moving to a new town four months later. I'm 22, and this incident happened a year and a half ago. I had just moved into my first apartment and was in the process of moving in. The door that led to my apartment locks itself automatically when closed. So I was going to the entrance of the apartment complex to get my mail while talking on the phone with my friend. I returned to the apartment and sat on the bed while opening the mail while using the phone. I dropped the phone on the floor and it landed under the bed so I had to lie on the floor and stretch for it. I saw something that caught my eye. There was someone under my bed. My eyes widened and I choked the urge to scream. The person under my bed was lying still with his back towards me and his head to his chest, so I couldn't see his face, and he didn't see me. Trying to be rational while so many thoughts rushed through my head, I picked up the phone, said, Sorry, I, I dropped my phone. I'm just going to take a shower and call you back. The bathroom is right by my bed, so I hastily walked in, quietly locked the door, turned the shower on, jumped out my window, and called the police. They told me to wait nearby, but to go across the street and see if anybody comes out the door of the apartment complex. This was during the summer and it was still light out. I placed myself across the street, hiding behind a car while watching my open bathroom window and the entry door. I called my friend and he came over just before the police. I gave them my keys and they went inside. Only moments later, two cops came out holding a thin and tired looking man. His eyes looked crazy, but he didn't try to get away. The policeman that stood beside me and comforted me while the police searched through my house told me that the man stood outside my bathroom door with one of my kitchen knives waiting for me to come out. This man had somehow crept in my entry door while I was getting my mail and hid under the bed. The man that was trying to hurt me turned out to be a homeless person and was placed in a mental hospital. When I was 21, me and my girlfriend were upstate in my family's vacation mobile home. It was during a snowstorm and we were sitting on the couch next to the heater, snuggling and watching late night TV. We were surrounded by absolutely nothing but forest in all directions and all that was keeping us from the outside was a wooden door that had a broken lock. The last time my grandparents came up, my grandpa put a few cinder blocks by the door to use as a kind of barrier in the meantime, since the door opened inwards. Anyway, while we were watching TV, my girlfriend started shaking me, telling me she heard something outside. I assured her it was most likely a deer or a bear or something, but then five minutes later, my girlfriend looked at me again. I heard it too. I muted the TV so we could hear it better. It sounded like someone was messing around in the little lawnmower shed outside. My car was parked outside and all the lights were on inside. If there was anybody out there, they knew we were inside. My girlfriend was urging me to go outside and check it out, but I told her she must be crazy to think that I was going out there. The sound stopped and there was nothing but the sound of the storm outside now. After a few minutes, I felt it safe to shut the inside lights and open the blinds to take a quick look outside, but it was too dark to see anything. I turned on the porch light and I was able to see a good portion of the front yard outside. There were footprints in the snow. Not animal footprints. They were clearly shoe prints and they were headed in the direction of the backyard. I went to open the curtains to the backyard window and when I did, I felt the urge to scream, but my girlfriend did instead. Even though there were no lights in the backyard, we could see a man dressed in all black and wearing a vendetta mask facing the window. 
I immediately shut the blinds and told my girlfriend to go hide in the bedroom while I grabbed my grandpa's hunting rifle out of the closet. I pushed the cinder blocks and a bunch of other heavy objects in front of the door as a barricade, shut all the blinds and lights, and went to hide with my girlfriend in the corner of the bedroom. There was a bang at the front door. He was trying to bust open the door. I don't even think he tried the knob, but it didn't matter either way. After a few futile bangs to the door, it seems the man finally gave up. I stayed up that whole night with the gun by my side while my girlfriend slept. We packed and left first thing in the morning, but the scary thing, there was a fresh set of footprints leading from the front yard window out into the woods. I haven't been up there since, but my grandparents have, and they said that there was no sign of a break-in or anything missing. I don't plan on ever going back up there. Back when my grandma was still alive, I would always walk down the block to her house every day to help with various chores. There was this one day that I walked over to her house the same time I always did and decided to let myself in. I was surprised she left the door unlocked. She was a very paranoid old lady and normally kept everything locked. I saw her bedroom door was opened upstairs and I heard her opening and closing drawers and cabinets. I walked upstairs calling grandma and as I was about five feet from the door, she slammed her bedroom door shut. I knocked, asking if everything was alright, and at that moment my cell phone began to ring. It was my grandma's phone number. I was so confused, but I picked up the phone anyway. My grandma was on the other end, telling me not to come over that day as she was walking over to her seniors club. I felt my heart skip a beat as she told me this. I hung up the phone before she could say anything else, remaining silent. I knew exactly what was going on. I played dumb and said, Grandma, I'll be downstairs, and made my way to my grandma's kitchen to grab a knife and dial 911. It remained silent in the bedroom after what happened. The police arrived and burst into the bedroom, and the loud and sudden bang of a gunshot caught me off guard. When the paramedics arrived and wheeled out the intruder, I recognized the man's face. It was my grandma's next door neighbor. Apparently, he saw that my grandmother had left the house and broke in to look for jewelry. And when the police broke into the bedroom, they found the man hiding next to the door with a large knife in hand. If I had walked into that bedroom, I would have been as good as dead. the most haunting memory of my life. Me and my wife were getting home from dinner out, and as soon as we stepped out of the car, we noticed that our front door to our house was open. I told my wife to wait outside while I ran inside and ran straight up to our bedroom where I hid the shotgun. I loaded the gun and scanned every single room upstairs. There was no sign of anybody. I made my way down to scanning the main floor, followed by the basement. There was no sign of anybody and there was nothing missing or moved. I called the cops and when they arrived I told them what happened and they began to investigate some rooms upstairs followed by the basement. Nothing was turned up. They made a case of asking us if we were positive that we shut the door when we left. I myself was starting to have doubts, not completely sure if I had, but my wife remained confident that we had shut the door. The police seemed sure that if somebody had broken in, they didn't stick around long, as there didn't seem to be any signs of burglary. My wife was worried sick, crying that she wasn't comfortable being in the house. I comforted her the best I could, assuring her that whoever broke in the house left in a hurry. I finally fell asleep after hours of rolling around in the bed, but my sleep was immediately cut short by the disturbing scream of my wife. I looked at her and she was staring intently in the direction of the closet. It hit me like a bullet just then. I had forgotten to check the second closet. I looked over and saw for the briefest second a man poking his head out of the closet before closing the closet door. Within five seconds I had the shotgun loaded in hand and cocked it back to let the intruder know that I was armed. I screamed for him to come out, and just like that, the closet door opened but instead of showing submission, he made a mad dash for the front door of the house. 
I could have shot him, but I didn't have it in me. He was never caught. He got away with it scot-free. I think having that gun saved us from a terrible fate. About a year ago, while still living under my parents' roof, I started experiencing some weird occurrences in my house, specifically my bedroom. While I was laying awake in my bed one late night, I heard a creaking sound coming from across the bedroom. My closet door had somehow been opened. When I got up to check it, I subconsciously checked for anybody inside my closet, even though I was 26 years old. Of course there was nobody inside, so I shut the door and went back to bed. Later that same night, I would hear rumbly rattling noises coming from up above the ceiling. It sounded like something in the air ducts. It was a very strange sound. I really had no idea what to think about it. But as soon as it stopped, I kind of forgot about it quickly and fell asleep. In the morning, I did tell my dad about sounds in the attic the previous night, but annoyingly, he didn't seem too interested, or he just didn't take me very seriously. That night, I again lay in my bed awake, reflecting on life, when yet again, the slow creak of the closet door creeping open broke the silence. This time, I felt genuinely afraid. I knew the door was completely shut. It would take somebody twisting the doorknob for it to be able to push open. This time I took an extra careful look inside the closet for anybody, even though it wasn't a big closet and there really wasn't anywhere somebody could hide. I rationalized it as being a broken doorknob or something, and that same night, I again heard the rattling sounds coming from above the ceiling. It was exactly what happened the previous night. The next morning I convinced my dad to take a look at my closet door, but he quickly determined that the door was fine. When it was closed, he pulled on it, and it showed no signs of coming off the latch. Of course, he suggested that I was simply leaving the door unlatched, but I knew I wasn't. That night, I sat up, waiting for it to happen again, and right on cue, the closet door creaked open. I waited for the sounds above the ceiling, but there was just a long silence. I turned on my lamp and looked up to the air vents in my room, and I screamed at the top of my lungs. I could distinctly see two wide open eyes peering through the vents at me. My parents barged into my room asking if I had gone insane. I explained everything, and they looked at each other like I had completely lost it. Not surprisingly, they dismissed it as a dream or the fact that I was too tired and was seeing things. They even began to lecture me about staying up too late. But to this day, I know I hadn't imagined it. It was too real. And the closet opening routinely? I know for a fact that wasn't in my imagination. I have never been a believer in the paranormal, but I still have absolutely no other explanation for those three nights. I live in the Poconos with my wife and kids. There's a small lake about a quarter mile away from our backyard. I commonly take my kids down there to go swimming, up until last week that is. Now, I'm never letting them go down there again. I haven't told anyone about this in fear of sounding crazy. It was last Saturday. We went over to the lake and set up our chairs on the sand. It's like a little private beach in our own backyard. It's been amazing. Me and my wife sat in our beach chairs enjoying the sun while our kids were splashing around in the water. I always tell them not to go too deep, they're still young, six and eight. We sat there for a good two hours that day, neither of us were in the mood to get wet. Eventually my wife got tired and decided to walk back home. I agreed to stay with the kids a little while longer, as they were somehow still having so much fun playing in the sand and water. The sun was setting at this point, and I was getting tired. They were going a little too deep, so I called at them to come back closer to the shore. They couldn't hear me apparently, so I stood up and got closer. Before I could call them again, I noticed something in the water. It, it looked like a black, roundish object, and it was moving, moving closer to my kids. I ran into the water closer to my kids, calling them to come out. When they got close enough, 
I dragged them out myself. When I turned back to the water, the object was gone. My kids were confused as hell. I didn't know what to tell them, so I just told them it was time to go home. We packed up and walked back to the house, but I wasn't happy when I got home. I was uncomfortable with what I just saw. That thing looked like no sea creature known to man. Dinner was waiting for us when we got home. I ate really slow, thinking about the object in the water and whether or not to tell my wife. My wife asked me what's wrong. She noticed that I was eating slow. Eh, I decided not to tell her right then. After dinner, I took a flashlight with me and walked back down to the lake. By then, it was already dark out. I got to the lake, but to be honest, I didn't even know what I was expecting to find. I shined the flashlight all around the surface of the water, searching for the black object. And just then, I heard a large splash come from somewhere in the lake. The kind of splash of something emerging out of the water. I thought it might be some kind of animal in the lake. I shined the light all over the place, searching for the source of the sound. And then I found it. And I realized... I was dead wrong. There was a silhouette of a humanoid figure with long, black hair covering its whole face. It just stood there, facing me, but not staring at me. Not that I could tell. I dropped the flashlight in horror and sprinted all the way back up to my house, slamming the door shut behind me. I haven't told anybody about this. What kills me is that that lake is only a quarter mile away from my house, and for all I know, that thing could be watching me through my window right now as I write this. This is a popular story with my family and most of my friends. Amanda is my brother's girlfriend. At the time of this story, she was looking for her first apartment and moving out of her parents' house. Her and my brother didn't want to move together since they'd only been dating for a few months. She opted instead to search for a roommate online. Browsing Craigslist, she found an ad titled something like, Roommate Wanted, Females Only. This sort of thing was common since the area she was looking in was mostly young professionals. The listing was for a room in a house for about $2.25 a month, which was quite cheap compared to most of the other places listed. The occupant listed herself as a 23-year-old college student that wasn't comfortable with living with any males. The other roommate would have their own room and attached bathroom. So far, Amanda was into this place. However, the listing only had a single photo from outside the property. Amanda sent an email wanting to meet the occupant and tour the house. Within 30 minutes, she receives an email back with all the details and time to stop by. The girl worked late hours and wanted Amanda to stop by at 8pm. When Amanda arrives, there's a handwritten note on the front door saying, Door broken. Use back door. Walking around the house, it looks nice, but slightly unkempt. Tall grass, weeds, dusty windows, etc. Still no alarms for Amanda, though. When she knocks on the back door, an older man opens the door. At first, Amanda thinks that she has the wrong house, but the man reassures her and says that the occupant was out and that he was the landlord. The occupant asked him to meet Amanda since she was working late. He seemed pleasant and offered to show her around. Alarms start going off, but aren't at red alert yet. First, the guy was clearly in his 40s, unshaven, and looked like he lived in his car. Also, only the kitchen light was on. As they walked around the house, Amanda noticed one huge red flag. No furniture. Nothing. The landlord was polite about answering questions, but seemed irritable to keeping the lights on for too long, rushing her around and only letting her look at rooms for a few moments. 
there was a single room that the landlord wouldn't open, telling her that it was the occupant's room and he didn't want to invade her privacy. As they walk down the hall into the living room, she notices the front door has a plank nailed across it, quote unquote broken for sure. Amanda's creepometer is starting to ding, so she decides to wrap up the walkthrough and leave, but trying to be polite. As she's given the guy her thanks for the showing bit, he perks up and states that he forgot to show her the basement. He claims it's recently furnished and would be a great rec room, and she should take a look down there. At the time, Amanda and the landlord are standing in the small hallway between the front living room and the back kitchen. In this little hallway was the basement door. When he opens the door, it opens outward to create something of a barrier between Amanda and the back door. The basement is pitch black. He smiles, motions down the stairs, and says, Ladies first. What happens next is nothing more than a stroke of luck. Amanda gets a text just as some random person parks in front of the house. Thinking on her feet, she pretends it's a phone call and answers her phone. Hey, yeah, are you here? I'll come out from around back and let you in. It's great, you have to see it. With a motion of confidence, she excuses herself around the landlord and walks out of the back door. She says the guy just looked at her like he was confused. Once outside, she sprinted to her car and sped like hell out of there. When Amanda got home, she told her mother and my brother everything. Cops were called. They took her statement and went to investigate. The Craigslist post had been removed. The house had been foreclosed over six months earlier. It was found out that the house had been foreclosed over six months earlier and the property had been abandoned. When the police investigated, they found that the closed room that the so-called landlord didn't want her to look in was where the man had been staying. There was a pile of old dirty blankets, rotten food, and empty gallon jugs everywhere. More creepy was he had plastered ripped up pages from porno magazines on all the walls in the room. The really scary part of this was the basement. The man had tied a thin piece of fishing twine at about shin level across the stairs about halfway down. The basement was empty except another pile of old blankets, a broom handle wrapped in leather belts, and a small box with a few rolls of assorted tape. I was up late looking for goalie equipment on Craigslist some night in the summer. I was only 14 and had no job, and therefore no money, so I had to find the cheapest deal possible. I didn't really care about the condition of anything. I came across an ad that seemed like a steal. The pictures showed the pads, blocker, glove, and stick. They were all in visibly good condition. It was only listed for $50. That seemed like an insane deal. I contacted the seller via text, and he asked me a few questions one of which was how old I am. I responded 14, and he told me he's glad to hear that I'm dedicated at a young age. It didn't really seem weird to me what he said at the time, but now that I look back on it, I should have been wiser. I asked the seller for his address, but he instead asked me what town I'm from, and that he could just meet me somewhere walking distance from my house. I didn't know how I felt about this, but I really wanted that equipment. We agreed to meet in the parking lot of the mall, which is literally down the block from my house. I stood alone in the exact spot I described for a few minutes, until I heard somebody toot their horn. I noticed a white van parked away from all the other cars, and then I received a text saying that he was in the white van. I replied telling him to come out with the equipment, but he said it would be easier to do the transaction in the van. I had a really bad feeling about this and hightailed away from there. I ran down the block, and when I looked back, I saw the white van driving down the street behind me. Now there was someone in the passenger side as well. I didn't want to lead them to my house, so I cut into some random person's backyard and hopped over the fence. I was on the opposite side of the block now, hiding behind a bush. Within 20 seconds, the white van passed by and turned the next turn, vanishing from sight. It was safe to run back to my house now. My parents flipped shit on me when I told them about it. I didn't get the tag number or a good look at their faces, so all they could report was a suspicious white van. The Craigslist ad was taken down so I couldn't show it to my parents. I thought it was over, but that night I heard a vehicle engine running outside. I looked out my window down to the street and saw the white van 
sitting across the street, but as soon as I looked out the window, the van drove off down the road out of sight. I haven't seen it since. I don't know if they saw me or not, or if they somehow found my address. It makes me paranoid to this day. I was selling a dining room set on Craigslist. I listed it for 1200 but put slightly negotiable in the title. It was a good looking set, but I wasn't getting any offers. I did live in the country though, so not a lot of people lived in my town. I finally received a call about the set. The man on the other end of the phone had a very shaky voice and he sounded a bit off, but I can't really explain how. He wanted to check out the set to make an offer, so I gave him my address and he said he would be over within the hour. I dusted off all the furniture one more time to make it look as nice as possible. The doorbell rang within 10 minutes. I was shocked. He must have lived really close, which in my area was very surprising. I opened the door and immediately felt uncomfortable about letting this man into my house. He was wearing a white undershirt with yellow stains scattered all over it. His pants were way too baggy and had a few tears in them. His gray mustache stained brown in the middle and his hair a complete mess. Basically everything you shouldn't look in public, he looked. Basically everything you shouldn't look in public, he looked. He greeted me with a hello in the same shaky voice as before. I invited him in and he immediately caught a glimpse of the dining room set since the dining room is the first room you see in the house. He began walking around really slowly, making weird sounds and making sure to feel every inch of every piece of furniture. I was very weirded out watching this and decided to break the silence by bringing up the price. I reminded him that my asking price was 1200 and then he stopped, looked up at me, and gave me the most unnerving smile I had ever seen. How about 500 he asked me. I laughed a bit at the insane offer, almost thinking he was joking. But when his smile turned to an angry expression, I knew he wasn't. I apologized and told him that's much too low for me. The lowest I would be willing to go is 1000 The man then started acting even weirder. He put his hands up to his head and started making strange noises again, pacing back and forth. He then looked at me with a look of anger and hatred. This man was not right in the head. I realized it just then and there, and I needed him out of my house. I apologized to him again and thanked him for coming, which was the most obvious way of me letting him know it was time for him to leave. But he didn't move. At this point, the stare he was giving me was obviously a stare of malice. This man was much bigger than me, and I didn't think I could take him in a fight. But then the man moved his hand to his back pocket, and I quickly assumed he was reaching for a gun. I ran upstairs to my bedroom to my closet, leaving the man alone in the dining room. In my closet, I grabbed my 45, loaded it, and took cover behind the wall, sneaking a peek into the dining room. The man was gone. I went back to my room and locked the door. I called the police and took cover behind my bed in the meantime. It felt like hours before I heard the police sirens outside my house. However, I stayed put behind my bed. For all I knew, that man was right outside my bedroom door. Thankfully, I hadn't locked the door, and I heard the police enter my house. I left the bedroom with my hands raised and showed them my ID. They had me wait outside while they continued their search. I sat there for probably five minutes before the two police officers stepped out of my house, with the man in handcuffs. They told me something disturbing. He was hiding in my pantry closet with a loaded gun. I feel it's only a miracle that the police weren't shot at. But the thing that still haunts me the most to this day was the look that that man gave me through the window of the police car as it drove off. A look of malice and hatred, like the first thing he would plan to do after getting out of jail would be to come back for me. I'm still thinking about moving. I can't deal with the constant paranoia of that man coming back. All I can say that can be learned from this is to be very careful when giving your address to people from Craigslist.
ever since I can remember, we've always had one of those old vintage Parker Brother Ouija boards sitting in our closet collecting dust. When I was a kid, I always wondered what it was. From the box, it seemed like a horrible board game, until one day I found out what a Ouija board really is, and immediately dug it out of the closet. I insisted on my brother trying it out with me, and eventually got him to play along. We put our hands on the planchette, and I began asking the typical cliché questions like, is there anybody there, and can you answer me? Other than my brother jokingly moving the planchette around to imitate an answer from some kind of entity, there was no real response. After getting bored, we put the game back in the box. I did a little research that night to find out how to make Ouija boards work. Many people said online that the most ideal environment when using a Ouija board is in a dark room only lit by candles. So when my parents weren't home, I managed to gather like six or seven candles and convince my brother to try it one more time. I lit the candles and set them around the table in the dining room with all the lights out. We tried one more time. I asked again if there was anybody there. The planchette began to move. I told my brother to stop moving it, but he swore he wasn't. I told him to move his hand away, and he did. It kept moving. My brother thought I was messing with him, but I didn't pay attention. The planchette landed on the word, yes. I was only nine, so I was legitimately shitting myself. My older brother had to take over. He asked the question, are you a good spirit? There was a five second pause before my brother's hand moved along with the planchette to the word, no. We both looked at each other, and at this point I ran to my room and shut the door behind me, but he continued on with the so-called game. I heard his muffled voice come from down in the dining room, when all of a sudden I heard him screaming at the top of his lungs. I ran back downstairs to see what was wrong. He was holding up his shirt, revealing a small open wound that almost looked like a claw mark. He told me to set the fireplace immediately, and I obeyed. He threw the thing in the fireplace and told me to never speak of what happened to anybody. We have never used a Ouija board since. I got a call from my cousin who said that he, his brother, his dad, and his best friend were using a Ouija board in their basement. Prior to starting, they took a large porcelain doll out of the room because it was creepy and placed it in the adjacent room face down on a pile of towels. My cousin took a short break because the board was just spouting nonsense and he had to go to the bathroom. His dad and brother and friends started asking the board questions without him. One of the questions was, who is in the other room? It just started spouting random numbers, and when my cousin came back into the room, his brother said that it wasn't working, that they were going to put it away, and he showed him the answer to the last question he asked, and he said, Dude, that's my social security number. Then they started to talk to whatever started spewing answers out. It told my cousin he would die in the Air Force. At this point they tell the entity they're communicating with to prove itself. It then spelled out the word, Dal, and they immediately got a bad feeling. They opened the door to check on the porcelain doll they had laid in the other room, and when they opened the door, the doll was standing up right in front of the door, staring at them. Everyone freaked out and ran out of the house. His best friend burned the Ouija board, and I think he temporarily went nuts for a few months. My cousin, for some reason, then joined the Air Force, and is on a base in Europe now. I had some of my friends over one night, so we tried out the Ouija board we found in someone's garbage. It had the board and the glass piece that you hold on to. The four of us held on to the piece and asked stupid questions, just messing around. At all times, one of us were moving around the glass piece just to try and fool the others. When one of my friends went to the bathroom and the other got bored, it was just me and one of my other friends still holding on to it. I asked the board when I will die, and the piece started slowly moving to the letter T. I laughed, looking at my friend, thinking it was him, but he just told me that he thought it was me. The piece then moved to the letter O, and then M, and then back to O, and then R, and then I realized that it was spelling out the word tomorrow. My friend let go of it, and it stopped moving, so I was convinced that it was him. But he swore left and right it wasn't him. But here's where it gets horrifying. The next day, while walking my dog to the preserve, 
my dog's collar suddenly snapped and he was free from the leash. He darted into the road and I immediately chased after him, only to hear the horn of an oncoming car blaring and getting louder. I dove as fast as I could out of the way, just barely grazing the car with my foot as it passed, but it didn't end there. The same day, while sitting under the ceiling fan in the kitchen on full blast, I got up to get something out of the fridge, and behind me, I heard a loud crashing sound as all the glass on the table was shattered and everything fell onto the floor. The fan had fallen off the ceiling, and I was inches away from being decapitated. I really don't know if I find it to be a coincidence that the day after the Ouija board said I would die the next day, that I had two near-death experiences. All I know is I'm never touching a Ouija board again. I have never really told people about this. We had a huge closet full of old board games, and one of them happened to be a Ouija board. I always wanted to try it out, but my family was always home, and I felt weird trying it in front of them. There was this one weekend that my parents were going to the city, and my brother was going on a Boy Scout camp out, so I would have the whole house to myself for a weekend. It might have been pathetic that I was more excited to try out a Ouija board than to party with friends while the house was empty. The weather was terrible, windy and rainy, but I felt that a rainy night would actually make it more ritualistic. Around midnight, I set up the board in my dining room and dimmed the lights. I asked a bunch of questions that generated no answers, so I eventually put the board away and went to bed. I woke up in the middle of the night to hear a creaking noise downstairs by the front door. At first I thought nothing of it, but then I heard it again, and it was closer this time closer to the stairs. I sat up now. At this point I was getting concerned. Another creaking sound, this time from one of the stairs. I was sure somebody was in my house. This was before cell phones were mainstream, so calling the police wasn't even an option. The creaking sounds were getting closer until they were right outside my door, and then they just stopped. It felt like hours while I laid there clutching my covers, waiting for something to happen. A huge strike of lightning momentarily lit up my bedroom, and I swore I could see some kind of black, limb-type objects wrapped around the open door. I tried to hold my breath to be as quiet as possible, but what happened next was the worst part. My door suddenly slammed shut, and I couldn't help but let out a shriek. By now I was completely under my covers, shaking and crying and wanting to scream. All the windows in the house were closed, so there was no drift. I just knew something was going to happen, but nothing happens. I sat under my covers for hours, thinking somebody or something was in the room with me. When the sun started to rise, I finally snuck a peek out of my covers. My room was just as empty as before. I somehow found the courage to leave my bedroom and search for any signs of a break-in. Everything looked normal, though. No broken windows or unlocked doors. I then spotted the Ouija board on the table again. I have always been kind of superstitious, so I immediately linked the happenings to the Ouija board. I chucked the damn thing in the outside trash can and brought it out front to the curb. Since then, nothing has happened, and I didn't tell anybody about it. You wouldn't understand unless you were in that kind of situation. Then you would agree that nobody would believe a word you say. Nobody really knows except for the people that read my story online. I know for a fact that those events were linked to the Ouija board. I can tell you from personal experience that trying a Ouija board is a huge mistake. It was the summer of 2013. My friend had a vintage Ouija board that was allegedly worth a decent amount of money. My friend agreed to trade it with me for a video game that I never played so I happily made the trade. I tried using it alone, but it proved to be just a scam. I didn't really expect it to work, I mainly got it just for the money to be made off of it. I threw the stupid thing on the floor of my living room and forgot about it. Everything was going normal until the next morning. I woke up and found that the two plants I had sitting on my coffee table had been knocked over, and the Ouija board was sitting on the table. I didn't remember putting it there, nor did I understand how the plants could have fallen over. Wind was definitely not an answer. I wondered if it was possible that I had sleepwalked, 
Or maybe I was half awake and walked down to get a glass of water and bumped into them or something. I moved everything back in place, but the carpet already had dirt stains on it. I brought the Ouija board box up to my room and tossed it on the floor. Things got bad that night. While laying awake in the dark, I was disturbed by the sound of a muffled click. I looked up, not sure what it was, and then I saw through the cracks of my closet door that my closet light was on. I had no idea how it could have turned on, but I got up and opened the closet door anyway. There was nobody in there, but that hadn't even crossed my mind. I turned the light off and jumped back into bed. Probably ten minutes later, I heard the same clicking sound. Naturally, I looked to the closet and felt my heart sink a little. The closet light was on again. A mix of confusion and fear started building up inside of me. I once again turned off the light and cautiously got back in my bed. I found myself waiting for the closet light to click on again, but what happened instead was much worse. Instead of the closet light turning on, the whole room suddenly filled with light as I heard the main light switch flick on. I had seen enough and was out the door within seconds. I quickly pieced things together and chucked that old Ouija board in the closest dumpster. Nothing weird ever happened after that. <laughs>